I used to work a normal office job at a small but profitable company. It wasn't a glamorous position by any means, but it was a decent living, and I still had it better than the interns at least. As an intermediate cog in the corporate machine, I'd sometimes be saddled with errands that were too important for interns, but not important enough for upper management to do themselves. One day I was ordered to bring some important documents to the topmost floor, the twelfth floor, for upper management to look through. I did what I was told and entered the company elevator with a folder full of files tucked under my arm. I watched the digital number display on my elevator slowly tick higher and higher as I got closer to my destination. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13? The elevator didn't stop at the floor I pressed. Instead, it passed it altogether to go to the floor above it, which is pretty damn weird since last I checked the building only had 12 floors. The metal doors parted to reveal an empty office floor, dimly illuminated by flickering fluorescent lights that permeated the air with a constant buzzing sound. Black shadows stretched across the gray carpeted floors, from empty cubicles that didn't even have computers on them. Strange, I thought. Did they add a new floor to the building without me knowing? Despite my better judgment, I stepped forward out of the elevator and into the strange office space that felt even more like purgatory than my own office. I was taken aback by the smell, or rather, the lack of it. We might not always notice it, but every public place usually has a mix of various smells. Stuff like the coffee sitting in an overworked employee's cubicle, the perfume of a female colleague, or even the smell of food left over on someone's breath after lunch break can all affect how a place smells. Yet standing there in the middle of the dark and empty office, I couldn't detect a single scent or hear a single thing aside from the buzzing of the light above me. Hello? I asked aloud, to no one in particular. Is anyone here? My voice seemed to echo off the drab white walls back to me, almost as if to mock me for asking such a thing when there was clearly no one around to hear me. Thoroughly creeped out, I turned around to get back into the elevator, just in time to see the metal door slam shut in my face with blinding speed, unlike the slow automated doors of most elevators. I instinctively reached out my hand to press down the button on the elevator panel, only to find that there was none. Starting to grow concerned, I tried to pry the elevator doors open with my fingers. It felt like the doors were fighting back against me as I did, but I finally managed to create a tiny gap between the metal doors. I peeked inside the elevator with one eye, only to find complete darkness. No elevator, no elevator shaft, just complete and utter blackness. My heart nearly stopped when a single red bloodshot eye opened up from within the void to stare back at me. I let out a yelp and jumped back, allowing the elevator doors to slam shut again. I doubted I'd be able to pry it back open again, and after seeing the eye into my soul, I don't want to either. I would just have to find another way out of there. I walked past the empty cubicles of the office space, guided only by the flickering lights above me. My hands still clutched the paper folder I was supposed to be delivering to my supervisors, but something told me that my impatient bosses were the least of my worries at that point. At the very end of the office space was a doorless doorway that led into a long dark hallway covered in the same sterile white wallpaper and dull grey carpet. I walked down the hallway hoping to find some sort of exit. Occasionally, I find another doorless doorway at either side of the hall that led into another room that almost looked exactly like the office space I'd arrived in with only small variations like the shape of the cubicles or the type of chairs being used. I eventually came across a room that made me freeze in my tracks upon seeing what was inside. It was yet another office space, just like all the others, but it looked like it had just been hit by a hurricane. The cubicles were all strewn across the floors, the chairs and tables lay broken on the carpet, and even the white walls were cracked in some areas. I poked my head inside to get a better look. When I did, the scentless odor of the hallway 
gave way to a heavy metallic stench that shot through my nostrils. I resisted the urge to gag and squinted my eyes in the darkness to try and find where the smell was coming from. Sitting hunched over something in a dark corner was a humanoid figure with their back turned to me. Although I couldn't see the figure's face, I could tell that they were bone thin and clearly malnourished from the bits of their spine protruding from their naked back. The wet, squishy sound of someone chewing emanated from the figure, diluting the constant buzzing of the fluorescent lights above. Just as I was about to enter the room, the light above them flickered on for a split second, and in that moment, I saw what the figure was crouched over, as well as the source of the metallic smell. An eviscerated corpse laid before them, its stagnant blood staining the gray carpet a dark shade of red. They were dressed in a formal suit like a typical office worker, not all too different from what I was wearing. Though, theirs were torn and stained with blood that poured from the giant gash in their torso. The emaciated figure was digging their bony hands inside the corpse's body and removing chunks of meat and organs. I felt my lunch bubble up from my stomach and was unable to keep it down. I vomited all over the floor, the former contents of my stomach splattering against the gray carpet with a loud splash. The creature immediately turned to me at the noise, and I was able to see its face for the first time. It looked vaguely human, with bloodshot sunken in eyes and stringy white hair that dangled from its balding scalp. He grinned at me with yellow blood-stained teeth. Fresh meat! It croaked before lunging at me. I dropped the paper folder I was holding and ran. Although my back was turned, I could clearly hear the sound of the creature's thundering footsteps on the carpet as it chased after me. I ran into another office room, pushing over chairs and tables as I passed in hopes of slowing down the creatures behind me. The room led to another office room through a doorway, which then led to several more almost identical rooms, with many doorways to rooms that looked no different from each other. I didn't have time to think about where I was going. I just ran into whatever room was closest to me, and hoped that the creature chasing me wouldn't choose the same one. Eventually, the sound of the creature chasing me ceased, and I was able to finally stop to catch my breath. I stood bent over with my hands on my knees as I panted for breath. When I finally regained my composure, I found myself in yet another office space with no idea where I was. It's been so long since then. I've lost track of how long I've been trapped here within these walls. I can't tell how many days or nights have passed, if day and night even existed in a place like this. I'm so hungry, yet I can't seem to die from starvation no matter how much I want to. I've lost so much weight that my bones are jutting out of my pallid skin. I've literally torn my hair out trying to find an exit, and what little of it left on my head has turned white from stress. Today I was awoken from my sleep by a sound I hadn't heard in what felt like forever. A nervous hello that cut through the incessant buzz of the fluorescent light. It stirred me from my slumber, and I dragged my skeletal body towards its direction. I arrived at the doorway to an office space with an elevator at the very end of it. Though, I can't tell if it was the same one that brought me to this place. Shaking in their boots in front of the elevator was a woman wearing a suit not too different to the one I'd arrived with. As I leaned into the doorway to get a closer look, I became entranced by her scent. She smelled so sweet and delicate, so different from the scentless void I'd become accustomed to. My mouth watered as I inched closer to where she stood, unable to see me approaching in the dark. I was so hungry. I worked in Disneyland as a security guard. It was the end of autumn and the beginning of winter. The park closed earlier that day, and all the workers were finishing their basic duties to leave for home. All the rides were returning to their coops, 
and lights were going off one by one. Disneyland after closing hours is a completely different world. Even though I was working there for four months, I could feel an odd vibe taking over that place after nightfall. There's the continuous feeling of being watched stayed with me as I made my usual rounds around the theme park. I always began with the Toontown, as it was the first one to close. Walking amidst the Toontown after the shutdown was an awful feeling. It felt like any time a psycho wearing a Mickey Mouse head would jump from the darkness and snap my neck. Yeah, thoughts like these are pretty common when you're alone in one of the largest theme parks around the world. Spook stories can be heard from the workers all the time. Even though some of my colleagues shared weird experiences while working here, I never saw anything scary until one night. I was eating my sandwich and watching some random videos on YouTube when I heard the rustling of bushes at some distance. I looked up but didn't see anyone. I thought it was probably a bird or a squirrel and ignored it. After 15 minutes, I got up to make a full round around the theme park. That was my third round of the night. This is to confirm that I already made two rounds and came to the conclusion that there's no one here except me and Smith. Smith's security room was on the other side of the park, hence we kept contact through walkie-talkies. While doing our rounds, we often met each other and shared a smoke for a break. So that night too, I started walking towards his room while scanning the surroundings. I came near the Indiana Jones adventure when I saw a figure coming out from the darkness. I stopped and watched a guy wearing sweatpants and t-shirts slowly going in the opposite direction, right in front of my eyes. I could tell it was a teenage boy with a malnourished structure. He was crossing the way so casually that I bet he didn't see me standing at some distance. Hey, how did you get in? I asked, but instead of answering me, he kept walking like before. He was limping as if one of his legs were badly hurt. Can I help you? Are you hurt, boy? Still, no reply came from him. I took a step ahead to go near him, just when he stopped and turned his head towards me. He kept his head down and made a muffled growl. It was so dark that I could barely see his face, so I flashed my light on him and found him staring at me with bloodshot eyes. Are you alright? Do you need help? The boy growled in a low voice and then turned back and started to run away. I also ran behind him, thinking he might have had some bad intentions. His eyes weren't normal at all, and maybe he sneaked in to do drugs. I mean, teenagers do crazy things, you know? Stop! Stop right now! But no matter how loud I screamed, he didn't stop. After almost 10 minutes of tiresome chasing, I stopped to catch my breath, and when I looked up, he was gone. The boy was nowhere to be found. I found myself standing in front of the sleeping beauty castle. I turned on my walkie-talkie to connect Smith. Smith? Are you there? Please answer. I called for him once again, but he didn't reply. I started walking towards the security room while continuously calling him through the walkie-talkie. When I reached his room, I found it empty. I was getting tensed just when Smith's voice came from the walkie-talkie. Walter, are you there? Yeah, man, where the hell are you? I'm checking the monorail tracks. The ride operator called me. He said it to run it once through, just to see if there was an issue with the operation device. But what happened? Smith, I saw this teenage boy. He must have sneaked in to do drugs. I tried to catch him, but he outran me somehow. He's still in the park. We should go look for him. Smith told me to wait until he finishes the test drive. From where I was standing, I could see the monorail tracks right above me. I waited for Smith to come down and lit a cigarette. I kept my eyes open, hoping to see that teenage boy once again. The sound of monorail coming close reverberated in the silent theme park. I was about to put out the cigarette butt just when something unexpected happened. The boy jumped on the ground from the roof of the security room. I heard his bones snapping as he stood upon the ground. I literally saw a white bone gushing out from his limb, making a bloody scene, but he stood like he felt no pain. What the hell is wrong with you? I screamed in shock and the boy once again turned his head at me, 
He smiled in a sinister way and then ran ahead at full speed. The pillar attached to the ground leading to the monorail track has small iron bars in it for the maintenance guys to climb up. He climbed those bars like a monkey and I saw the inevitable happen in front of my eyes. As soon as the boy reached above the track, the speeding monorail rushed at him and ran over him in a wink. A spine-chilling growl took place and I heard Smith pulling the brakes. The monorail stopped on the tracks making a loud squeaking sound and everything went silent. It took me some time to grasp the entire scenario. Smith started calling out for me while fumbling in fear. Who can think straight after running over a person, right? I slowly walked to the nearest halt and saw the monorail going backwards. After moving back from the spot where the boy was standing, Smith stopped the monorail and came out. His face was all pale, just like mine. We were sweating in fear. It was time to walk the tracks and discover the remains of that teenager. No one has to tell us that it's going to be bloodshed, with organs scattered everywhere. My heart was beating so loud that at some point I thought it would come out of my chest. Taking slow, intense steps, we went to the spot, and as we peeked to see what we were expecting, our eyes widened in horror. There was nothing on the tracks. No blood, no human remains, not even a footprint. Smith and I exchanged a confused look. We were pretty sure that that boy was run over by the monorail. We walked the track twice, searching for some clue to define his mysterious disappearance, but we found nothing. Is this possible for two sane adults to hallucinate such a vicious scene without being under a state of intoxication? I don't think so. Smith and I didn't tell anyone about this. I changed my shift and Smith resigned after a week. I knew it was hard on him to continue working there after that night. Months went by until one day I overheard a conversation of the maintenance staff. I heard one of them mentioning a teenage boy sneaking inside the park after closing hours. I rushed to her and asked her what's the deal with this boy, to which she told me. In June of 1966, a teenager tried to sneak into Disneyland for a grand night by climbing a fence and crossing the monorail track. When he was spotted by a security guard, the teenager ran, but he was struck and killed by the monorail train. It is said that the ghost of the teenager can be seen at night, running alongside the monorail train. I wanted to share how true this tale is, but it's better to keep a little information with yourself sometimes. I've left the job long back, but whenever I imagine the scene of that boy jumping on the tracks, I get shivers, thinking he was already dead before he died once again, right in front of us that night. I got mixed up with the wrong crowd during high school. Coming from an already troubled household made me more inclined towards harmful things. I didn't hesitate to ride a bike at full speed after getting hella drunk or following shady strangers to try new kinds of drugs. Yes, I was reckless and I probably still would have been if that dreadful experience never happened. My dad used to beat my mom almost every night after getting drunk. She hit him too with whatever she could grab and it was a ruckus around house 24-7. I started spending nights chilling out with whoever bought me booze. Sometimes, I even woke up on a sticky, dirty floor next to a pile of blood-stained syringes. I was so high that I could not even remember how I got there in the first place. Somehow, I would pick my miserable self up while cleaning the vomit off my clothes and walk out of the house pushing aside junkies lying all over the dingy house. I was in such a state that I kept saying to myself, what worse can happen at this point? But only if I knew that the nightmare was about to come. Unlike every other night, I stormed out of the house as my parents fought like animals. My mom screamed saying, are you going to your druggy friends? I turned around and replied, I don't have any friends. You all disgust me. Honestly, I don't care if anyone finds me guilty for behaving this way, but it was indeed the truth. I lit a cigarette as my craving started to kick in. A 
called a guy named Kramer who often hooked me up with pot and ecstasy, but he didn't pick up my call. Running out of options, I started to walk towards Skid Row. Everyone familiar with downtown LA knows it's last resort for homeless people and druggies. As I walked through the alley of shadow and dirt, the burnt smell of toxic chemicals started to jam up my nostrils. People lying in the muddy, dirty corners, being high as a kite, and saying gibberish in that state of trance was a common thing for me. I saw two guys smoking something standing near a dumpster. As I got close to them, they offered me a drag without saying anything, and I took a puff without giving it a second thought. As soon as the smoke entered my mouth, I felt I just smoked years of preserved tar mixed with the stench of rotten eggs. My head started to bang heavily, and my vision became blurry. The scary part of the high is, I wasn't passing out and yet felt like falling. I walked ahead while those two freaks laughed at me seeing my condition. I somehow sat down near a pile of garbage bags and thought about sleeping for the night there when a squeaky voice spoke to me. Up for some adrenaline rush? What? Who? Who are you? We can be friends if you want. Look man, I don't want any more trouble for tonight. Just please, leave me be. I see. Guess I will find someone for the party. Wait, there's a party? Where? In that garage under the basement. I have buddies there. Wanna come? I thought it would be better to take shelter under a roof than pass out on these dangerous streets. So I got up somehow and agreed to follow the man. He seemed like he's in his late 40s. There were scratches all over his face, but he has excessively bright eyes that could look into your soul. He walked like a shadow. No matter how fast he walked or whatever came under his feet, no sound ever took place. We came near a turn and the man stopped. He gazed around suspiciously and said, this way. The turn led to a narrow lane. After walking two to three minutes more, we reached in front of a rusty metal door. He knocked on the door thrice and a pair of eyes peeked from a small square shaped hole on the door. The man from the other side of the door asked, who is it? To which he replied, Enderman. The door opened immediately and we entered into a small corridor. At the end of the corridor stood another big door. Behind that door, I could see neon lights flicker. The sound of subdued loud music also echoed in that corridor. The man who opened the door was a bald guy who was probably a drug dealer or someone of that sort. He handed over a small pouch of white pills to this man and we two walked to that room at the end of the corridor. As I stepped in, I saw seven to eight men sitting in front of computers playing video games. A neon light sign reading Minecraft was attached to the front wall. Noticing their screens, I realized they're all playing Minecraft at various stages. The way they played seemed very freaky to me. Their eyes were wide and filled with dark circles as if they are playing for a long time without taking a break. The man gave me a disturbing grin and said, Welcome to my den. You can call me Enderman. These are all my players. Your players? Yes. Come on in. Grab a seat. He pointed out to a beanbag kept near the door, and I sat down. I am familiar with this game. One of my friends was crazy behind it. I didn't quite enjoy this game because of its endless exploration. I mean, yes, you get to win trophies, but this game never ends, which kind of creeps me out. I thought maybe they're having a competition or bet to win a real prize because they were so dedicated to the game that none of them took their eyes off the screen for one second. It was like they must keep playing no matter what. My curiosity kicked in and I asked, what are they playing for? The man laughed in a creepy way saying, <laughs> they're live. What? What do you mean by that? They might be in different levels, but they all have to follow one rule. If you die in Minecraft, you die in real life too. <laughs> Before I could get a hold of everything this man was saying, one of the players started to slap himself vigorously. Oh my God, why is he doing that? He's just trying to be awake so he doesn't die in the game. The more I watched these players, the more I realized what a psycho this man is. But what he did next gave me chills. One guy started to scream saying, no, no, no. And then 
for the first time, turned at us. His eyes were bloodshot, as if he hadn't slept for days. He fumbled in a painful voice. Please, Enderman. I can, I, can, I can start again. Please, I'm doing this for the last three days. Please, let me go. The psycho walked close to him and said, There's only one rule here. If you die in the game, you die in real life. <laughs> he took out a gun and bashed the poor man's brains out. Blood splattered everywhere. Drops of blood fell on the other player sitting next to the poor man, but he didn't even show emotions. It was as if he can't spare a single second to act on whatever craziness going on around here. None of them said a single word, moved a single muscle to react to this ruthless murder happening in front of their eyes. They kept playing like before. Are you all insane? I screamed and bolted out of that room. I ran at full speed through that dingy corridor. That bald guy came to stop me, but I was quick. I pushed him and sprung out sliding that metal door with all my strength. I don't know how I carried myself home that night, but the next morning, I went there again to look for those people. But the metal door was sealed with a huge lock and chains. It was closed from the outside, and I realized they are gone. Whoever that man was, he was batshit crazy, no doubt. I don't know if he's still out there playing the character of Enderman while putting his players in a terrible fit. I was going through my shopping cart when my eyes went to a girl standing near the counter. She was scanning the entire Target store with her nervous eyes. It was near closing hours, hence the store had very few customers. There were two other people at the counter. The manager was a 50-year-old man with a sharp face. I noticed him staring at the girl with a not-so-gentleman look. The girl was wearing a flower-printed short skirt and a red tank top. Honestly, she was attractive, and I immediately realized why she felt uncomfortable standing near that counter. It was clear from her face that she was hesitating to approach the man at the counter. Once those two people left the store, the girl moved her cart away and started going back to the store shelves again. I couldn't help but ask her, Hey, is everything all right? To which she replied, Yeah, uh, I just forgot to get some snacks. I could have just bought my stuff and left the store, but I decided not to leave the girl alone with this weird dude at the counter. Care for billing? The man at the counter asked in a rough voice. No, I will just wait for her to come back. I replied, pulling my cart aside. Needless to say, he wasn't happy at all as I robbed him of one chance to be alone with an attractive girl and make her uncomfortable in every possible way. I did what I felt I should have done for my sister if she was in place of that girl. After waiting 10 minutes when the girl didn't come back, I started to look for her. I went straight to the snacks area where the girl mentioned, making a check, but there was no one. Standing in the empty passage, I was wondering if she left using the back door out of panic when suddenly I noticed her cart parked at the end of the passageway. Why did she leave her shopping cart like this? I looked here and there, but didn't see her. I started searching for her in the empty store. Light rain was going outside, and the murmur of thunder hinted towards an upcoming storm. I was already late, so when I didn't find her after searching for almost 15 minutes, I gave up. I was heading back towards the counter when a huge lightning struck nearby and the power went out. The storm has begun. Heavy winds blew like crazy, making the store's glass wall tremble with its pressure. Um, hello? Anybody? I took out my phone and turned on the flashlight. I heard a soft whimper behind me and turned back right at that moment. The girl was standing there. She was covered in sweat, and tears rolled down from her eyes. He locked us inside. What? Who? The man at the counter. He's a freak. He had a gun. I have seen it. I had no idea about whatever she was saying. I looked at my phone and saw there was no network. The phones aren't working, right? How did you? He is probably looking for me now. He's going to kill us both. I couldn't decide what to do at that moment. The girl was saying really scary things about that guy at the counter. I had to act on this matter, so I decided to check the exit first. She said the man locked the exit. But why would he do that? I mean, yeah, he appeared like a weirdo to me, and yeah, he was trying to flirt with that girl. But is he really a killer roaming around this empty Target store? I calmed myself down and said to the girl, we should go to the front door and check if we can open it. Also, 
We have to get out and call 911. There's no signal inside the store. The girl nodded her head and started to follow me. We were walking side by side. There was pin drop silence. And in that huge store, I felt like we were going to get lost in the dark. The storm was roaring outside and I could hear the nervous breathing of that girl. I wasn't able to figure out which way is the main door in that excessive darkness. Also, my mobile's battery was draining out. I gave my phone to the girl and said, you wait here, I'll go grab a flashlight. We were walking amidst the hardware section. I could almost see flashlights hanging, so I walked ahead and grabbed one. I was about to walk back to her when someone grabbed me from behind and pulled me aside. Whoever it was placed a hand on my mouth so that I couldn't scream. It was a strong hand, and it pinned me on the other side of the huge shelf. Out of shock and panic, I turned on the flashlight, and it was him. The weirdo from the cash counter. His eyes were wide, and blood was dripping from a cut on his forehead. He spoke in a low but panicked voice. We must get out of here. That girl is out of her mind. I was extremely surprised, thinking, what the hell is he talking about? He is the one who chased her like a killer. The man took his hand off from my mouth. What are you saying? She told me you're the one who was trying to kill her. What? She's the one who attacked me. She'll, hey, did you get the flashlight? Hurry up, we need to go. I saw the girl walking towards us with my phone in her hand. As soon as she reached close, the power came back and I found myself standing between the man and that girl. They both saw each other and their faces turned pale. Will anyone tell me what's the deal with you two? This man said that you attacked him. What? Look at him. Look at me. He's lying. Didn't you see how he was checking me out at the counter before? He is the reason why I scared off that moment. Oh my God, she is such a lying bitch. I'm telling you. Please believe me. I saw her lunge over that dead body in the storeroom. That's when she tried to attack me. She's the one who hit me on the forehead with a spanner. I don't have a single drop of blood on my hands. You murderer. Don't trust him. Now think about my situation. I had no idea what these two were saying. So to get my head straight, I asked them to take me to that body in the storeroom. The man walked ahead and I followed him for not having any other option. The girl went on saying how I should not listen to him, but I had to consider both sides. When we reached near the storeroom, the man opened it in one go saying, look, there it is. There was indeed a bloody body of a young woman on the floor. Her mouth was slid open in a pretty gruesome manner. It was so violent that one could barely stand the sight. Her eyes were jumping out from the sockets and blood was everywhere. Oh my God, we need to call the cops. Yes, and put this man in jail for what he did. What, me? I didn't do anything. You're the one sitting near this body. I'm gonna tell the cops what I saw. Yeah, obviously because I found her when I went back to get those snacks. So you mean she was already dead when? I immediately hit the guy in the head with all my strength. He fell on the floor screaming at the top of his lungs. You were right, he is the murderer. Let's go, we have to find a way out. I was telling you he is the one. Thank you so much for trusting me over him. I found the woman in the storeroom. I swear, I was just checking her out and when I turned back, I saw this guy standing behind me with an evil look on his face. I mean, he was behaving really odd the moment I entered the store. He came at me so I grabbed the spanner from the storeroom and hit him in my defense. Trust me, I just did that to save myself. That's when the power went out. I met you all freaked out. Yes, I trust you, don't worry. I took the girl towards the entrance and told her to wait near the door. There were two locks on that door. I walked straight to the counter and picked up a keychain full of keys. The girl stood beside me and I opened the first lock of the door. She said in a relieved voice, thank God we will finally be able to get out. I thought this night would be the but she didn't finish her sentence. She started to step back nervously again. How did you guess the key right at the very first attempt? What? How did you find the right key at the first attempt? Look, I really don't know what you're trying to say. It was just a wild guess. You're the one who killed that woman, right? And now, now you killed that man too? Oh my God, he was telling the truth? Well, I couldn't lie to her anymore. I was anyway going to take her to some unknown road, slash her neck, and dump her body in the woods. Then why not do it now? I gave her a friendly smile, but she still didn't stop being afraid of me. I tried to calm her down, but 
She made me chase her the entire store. The more I laughed and tried to make things comfortable for her, the more she screamed. I mean, think about it. What other option do I have? I was returning home after finishing my final kill of the night. I put the body of that woman in the storeroom and was all set to leave. My intentions were all good. I knew that man was being a creep, so I waited for that girl, but look at this dumb bitch. She had to go back and sneak into the storeroom for no fucking reason. She had to find that body. I could have already hit her from behind when she lunged on the dead body and watched it with scary eyes, if not the man came in the same direction. I hid behind the shelf and watched that entire drama unfold. None of them had a single idea that I am the predator and they were my prey. But no regret. Three kills instead of one? Not bad, huh? All I have to do now is dump these three bodies inside that storeroom, then destroy the security footage and drive home. Can't wait to finally enjoy a long shower with a glass of wine before going to bed tonight. My twin brother and I became homeless at a young age. Our parents were abusive, so we ran away from home when we were 13. They didn't even bother reporting us as missing. I guess they must have been glad to have us out of their hair. Trying to live on the streets was hard, but it was still better than living with our parents. Besides, we always had each other. For a time, we thought that was all we needed to survive. No matter what problem came our way, we thought the two of us could overcome it together. Whether it be starting a fire in a trash can to keep warm during the winter, or scavenging the dumpsters behind restaurants for leftovers, we did it all together. I know it sounds like a miserable existence, but despite all the hardships we faced, we were able to find some semblance of happiness and content in each other's company. We were a family. That is, until the day we met the cult that would ruin both of our lives. Our first exposure to them came from one of their recruiters. To this day, I remember how out of place those people looked strolling around the dirty, piss-stained alleyways where homeless people slept. They were all dressed in fine, well-fitted suits that were just asking for trouble in that part of town. Their wealthy appearance would have made them prime targets for muggers had they not been traveling in a sizable group. At the time, I found it strange that a bunch of people who were all clearly rich enough to afford loitering anywhere else would even choose to be in this part of the city. My brother and I huddled close to each other under our shared tattered blanket. We were trying to make ourselves as small and unnoticeable as possible, so the people would ignore us as they passed. The last time a non-homeless person noticed us in the alleyway, they beat the shit out of us for fun, and we didn't feel like going through all of that again. One of them approached us and my brother immediately put himself between me and the suited man. Although we were twins, he often played the role of a protective brother to me, even at the cost of himself getting hurt. To our surprise, the suited man didn't act aggressive. He just stopped in front of us with a gentle smile on his clean-shaven face. Are you kids doing alright? He asked, as if talking to an old friend. We're doing fine, thanks, my brother said just trying to get by. The suited man tilted his head to look at me. Does she feel the same? I hid behind my brother and averted my eyes. The man just let out a small laugh. <laughs> Shy one, isn't she? He said, as calm as ever. Look, can you tell us what it is you want from us? My brother asked, growing even more defensive. We don't exactly have much to give and it doesn't look like you need anything from us either. Oh, we don't want anything from you, the man assured us. In fact, we have something to offer you. And what might that be? My brother asked, though he sounded skeptical of the stranger's charity. Everything you don't have now. Clean clothes, a roof over your head, and some food to fill your bellies with. My stomach let out an involuntary growl that I hoped the man didn't hear. It had been weeks since we had a proper meal that didn't come out of the trash can. The mere mention of food reminded my body of its own desperation. Yeah, forgive me for doubting you, but why on earth would you do that? My brother asked. What's in it for you? We're not selling our bodies to you if that's what you're getting at. Oh, heavens no, 
The suited man sounded genuinely surprised at the insinuation. All we want is to spread the word of our religion. That's all. You just have to come with us to our church and listen to our sermons. We'll give you food to eat, new clothes to wear, and a comfortable bed to sleep on for as long as you're there. And of course, if you don't like it there, then you're free to leave at any time. We'll get to sleep in a bed? I asked, speaking up for the first time since the suited man approached us. Of course, the suited man said. You'll be well taken care of in the house of our God. I looked at my brother with pleading eyes. The hopeful look on my face must have broken down his wall of doubt about the suited man's offer. Our situation couldn't get any worse anyways. And besides, it wasn't strange for a church to offer free charity to the homeless, right? The two of us followed the suited man, whose name we learned was Gabriel, to a large church tucked in an obscure corner of the city. It didn't look all that different from a regular church, not that I've been to many churches in my life. The only weird thing about it was how the cross at the very top of the church seemed to have a large eye carved in the middle of it. A nice older lady who wore the same strange cross around her neck greeted us at the church entrance. She handed us some new clothes and led us to the church bathroom to change. The clothes they gave us were weird to say the least. The pants were normal, but the top was a long ankle-length purple robe with the eye-bearing cross emblazoned over the heart. Literal beggars like us couldn't be choosers, though. So my brother and I both changed into them and took a seat in the church pew alongside dozens of other people dressed in the exact same purple robe. A man started distributing sandwiches and bottles of water to everyone seated. My brother and I were so hungry that we gobbled up our sandwiches in seconds, not even bothering to register its taste. The man distributing the food chuckled. <laughs> You two look like you could use seconds, he said, before handing us both an extra sandwich. So far, everything was great. My brother and I were ecstatic at finally finding people who seemed to care about us. But then, the sermon started. A man behind the church podium began speaking about how mortal minds were unable to handle divine wisdom, and that it is our duty as human beings to strive to see the world the way that God does as much as possible. He explained that the church's name was the Temple of the Third Eye, and that they were dedicated to letting people see the world through God's eyes, through their teachings and rituals. The more he spoke, the more I felt like he wasn't talking about any God I'd ever heard of. That didn't matter, though. Even if I didn't believe them, they were the only ones to ever give me the time of day aside from my brother. The least I could do was listen to what they had to say. After the sermon was over, we were all escorted by the preacher to a building attached to the church where hundreds of beds lay. He told us that for as long as we were part of the church and attended the sermons, we could sleep there and be fed by them three times a day. It all seemed too good to be true and it was. My brother and I got into a fight for the first and only time in our lives later that night. He wanted us to leave, called the church a dangerous cult that would only spell trouble down the line. He was right, but I didn't want to listen. I told him that even if he was right, I would rather stay there where it's safe and warm instead of going back to live on the streets again. My brother left the church before night fell. The members of the church didn't stop him. Instead, they comforted me and assured me that they would take care of me for as long as I stayed there. I felt like I was being welcomed to a new family, one that could care and provide for me in the cold and uncaring world. Years passed as I grew into an adult under the temple of the Third Eye's care. I became more and more involved in the dark side, hiding underneath its charitable exterior. Even when they started putting me to back-breaking labor to earn my keep in the church, I only saw it as me paying them back for everything they'd done for me as a hungry, homeless kid. In that time, I've lied for them, stolen from them, and in the end, I killed for them. A journalist had been reported snooping around the church one time too many, and the higher-ups at the Temple of the Third Eye were getting worried. They decided that their best course of action would be to silence him permanently. My indoctrinated mind felt honored to be asked to defend the faith, 
when I was chosen for the task by my seniors. I would only later learn their true reason for choosing me when it was much too late. I was given the reporter's address and told to wait to kill him there. It was a crappy studio apartment in the rough part of town that even the police tended to ignore. Human life was cheap there, so my seniors were hoping that the authorities would chalk his murder up to a burglary gone wrong or a gang hit gone right. I broke into the apartment through the back window with a hammer and waited for him next to the front door. When I heard the doorknob rattle an hour later, I held my hammer up to prepare to strike. The reporter opened the door and stepped inside. Our eyes met for a split second, and surprise flooded his face, and he opened his mouth to speak, but I brought the hammer down on his head before he could say anything. I felt his skull shatter upon impact with a sickening crack. Blood spurted off the top of his head and trickled down his shocked face. His eyes rolled into the back of his skull before he crumpled to the floor, lifeless. My job was done, and my heart was pounding. I wanted to leave right away, but something about him was still bothering me. Unable to shake the uneasy feeling growing inside me, I closed the door to the apartment and took my time flipping his body over to examine his face. Upon closer inspection, I realized with a mix of horror and regret what it was that bothered me about him. I knew his face. He had the same exact face as mine underneath the stubbles of his beard. The man wasn't just a random journalist looking for a big story. He was my twin brother. The same one I'd abandoned all those years ago for the cult that took over my life. My seniors at the Temple of the Third Eye knew my brother would never hurt me if he recognized me, so they sent me to kill him knowing he wouldn't retaliate. They overestimated my loyalty, however. I immediately turned myself into the police for my brother's murder and cooperated with them to expose the Temple of the Third Eye. I hope I was able to help in bringing that cult down for good. Now, I'm serving my sentence in prison for killing my brother and will be for a long time. I betrayed the only family I ever had for a place to sleep and food to eat. Here in prison, that's exactly what I get, and it's more than I deserve. I entered the train carriage and immediately forgot why I was there. Welcome back, greeted a voice I'd never heard before. I turned to the direction of the voice and saw an unfamiliar man dressed like an old-timey train conductor. Although I was sure it was him who spoke, he didn't bother to look up from the newspaper he was reading to address me. Um, hi, I said awkwardly. Good day to you too, Joe, the train conductor said, his eyes still fixed on the newspaper. Joe? I asked. Is that my name? That's what I've been told, so it must be, the conductor said casually. Excuse me, but who told you? The guys who put you here, obviously. I took a moment to examine my surroundings. It looked like the interior of an old train from when trains were just invented. The walls and ceilings were all carved from wood. The windows were all covered up in red curtains, and every seat looked like it was made from comfy leather cushions. Where is this place exactly? Look outside and find out, said the conductor casually. I cautiously approached the nearest window and peeked past the curtain. I let out a scream and stumbled backwards the moment I saw what laid beyond it. The outside of the train was engulfed in red and orange flames, and within the fire I could see the melting faces of people their faces twisted in perpetual agony as the flames licked the flesh off their bones without killing them. What is this? I shouted. It's a giant lake of fire, the conductor said dryly. What do you think it is? I stared at him with an incredulous look on my face. Am, am I in hell? Not quite yet, the conductor replied. Please, you gotta get me out of here, I pleaded. I don't belong there. <laughs> That's what everyone there thinks, the conductor said. Isn't there a way out of here? I started to panic as realization dawned on me. 
I turned around to open the door I'd come in, with only to find it locked tight. Wrong door, buddy, the conductor said. For the first time, I saw him. He put his newspaper down and pointed down the hallway. Try that one. Is it a way out? I asked, hopefully. The conductor turned to look at me, and I was able to see his eyes for the first time. His eyes were pitch black pits, though I could see the flicker of a flame somewhere deep inside him. Keep going in that direction, and never look back, the conductor said, and you'll forget all about everything that's happened here. You'll be able to start everything over from scratch again. Thank you for telling me, I stuttered. I'll get out of here and be a good person, I, I promise. You won't regret this. Thank you so much. You shouldn't be thanking me, said the conductor, but you're welcome anyways. I opened the door out of the carriage and forced myself through. The fires outside burned my skin and clothes, but I pushed through the pain. For a torturous few minutes, I felt the flames scorch my flesh as I fumbled on the bridge between carriages to open the door. Finally, I managed to open the door to the next carriage and immediately collapsed inside. The door behind me mercifully slammed shut by itself and shielded me from any more fire. I laid there for what felt like minutes, waiting for the pain of my burns to subside. Just as the pain was beginning to dull, I heard a voice in the carriage call out to me. Tickets, please. I looked up and saw another train conductor different from the one in the last carriage, glaring down at me with the same kind of soulless, empty black eyes. I... I'm sorry, but I don't have a ticket with me, I told him. No, the conductor retorted. I believe you do. He reached into his shirt pocket and took out a pair of scissors, the short, thick kind with a sharp, curved blade you see being used to cut tree branches. Confused, I picked the scissors up with one burnt hand and looked at the conductor. What am I supposed to do with this? The conductor tapped on his left pinky finger with his right index finger. Your ticket, please. My eyes widened when I realized what he was asking me to do. Y you can't be serious. I am, the conductor said solemnly. You must provide a ticket or be forced out of the train. I'm sure you know what that entails. The prospect of getting kicked out of the train and into the hellish fire outside pushed any hesitation out of my mind. I took the scissors and put my pinky finger in between the curved blades. I held my breath and quickly squeezed the blades close. The blades easily tore through my already burnt flesh and crunched through my bones. I screamed in pain until my vocal cords were hoarse. The conductor simply picked up my severed pinky from the floor and put it in his pocket. You may proceed, he told me, and you may keep the scissors. You will be needing them again. He wasn't kidding. I rushed to the next carriage, getting even more burns as I did, and was met with another conductor blocking the door to the next carriage. My heart dropped when I heard what he had to say. Tickets, please. Every carriage was the same. I'd get a taste of the hellfire outside for a split moment and be threatened to be thrown back outside if I didn't fork over another part of my body. The fingers on my left hand were the first to go. They only allowed me to keep three fingers on my right hand so that I could snip off my ears and toes for the conductor's tickets. After slicing off my nose to give to yet another conductor asking for a ticket, I wondered what else I could possibly cut off to give the conductors. I could think of a couple things, but I prayed that it wouldn't come to that. I pushed through the hellfire again and into the next carriage. I fell onto the carriage floor and looked up expecting to see another conductor. Instead, I was pleasantly surprised to find no one waiting for me there. I got up to my feet and was surprised to find that the toes I'd severed were suddenly back on my feet. I looked at my hands and realized that my fingers had somehow grown back as well. This is it, I thought. I could finally leave this place once and for all. I tossed the accursed scissors on the ground and ran to the exit. Outside, I found another carriage on the other side of the connecting bridge, but this time, 
The fires of hell didn't burn me as I walked past it this time. I grabbed the handle of the carriage door and pushed it open, expecting to find earth or heaven on the other side. I entered the train carriage and immediately forgot why I was there. Welcome back, greeted a voice I'd never heard before. I turned to the direction of the voice and saw a man dressed like an old-timey train conductor. I was always a bit of a party animal. I only stopped going to clubs and bars every night once I got engaged. Once the engagement fell through, I went right back to my old habits, dancing and drinking whole nights away and taking just about every club drug you can think of. I was on my first night of clubbing without my fiance sending me a hundred texts asking where I was and that knew that bachelor's life was the life for me. The feeling of blissful freedom wouldn't last though. One day, I was having fun at a nightclub as usual with a new girl I met at a different club a few nights prior. We'd already downed quite a few cocktails and we were both more than a little bit tipsy. She suggested that we have a go at dancing. I knew it was a bad idea. My vision was blurry and my stomach was one sudden move away from emptying itself. Nevertheless, I couldn't turn down a cute girl's invitation to dance just on principle alone. We had a good time dancing with each other under the flashing strobe lights of the club. Things were getting a little hot and heavy between us. For a moment there, I thought I might actually get lucky that night, if you know what I mean. At one point, she took me by the hand and started pulling more suggestive dance moves with me as her partner. <laughs> I thought I'd hit the jackpot. But before I could get too happy, I noticed something from the corner of my eye that made me stop dancing. I turned my head and saw her. Standing alone in a dark corner of the club was my ex fiance She was pale and filthy. The white cloth of the dress she wore was tattered and covered in dirt. The heat in my body drained away, replaced by a chill of fear that bit right into my bones. What's wrong? Asked the girl I was with. Um, it, it, it's nothing, I told her. Just had a little too much to drink, that's all. Aw, she sounded disappointed. Well, that's a shame. I was hoping we could dance for a bit longer. You want to call me a cab? No, I'm good. I'll just walk back. I could do with some fresh air anyways. I stumbled out of the club while the girl I was hoping to go home with stayed behind to keep drinking alone. A girl like her probably won't stay alone for long in a place like that though. I cursed myself for missing my chance to score just because of something that happened in my past. It seemed like my ex-fiance was still holding me back even after I cut her out of my life. I walked through the empty streets, the alcohol still not fully flushed out of my system yet. My blurred vision made it hard for me to see anything around me while my splitting headache made it hard for me to care much about it. I must have looked like the sort of wandering drunkard parents would warn their teenagers about when going outside at night. The sort of guy you'd cross the street to avoid. At one point, I tripped over an uneven towel on the sidewalk. I managed to steady myself in time not to fall on my face, but all the booze I'd drunk splashed around in my stomach. I felt a burning sensation rising from the pit of my stomach and up into my esophagus. I lurched forward with a wretch. I kept my hand over my mouth to keep my mouth from vomiting as I fought back my own gag reflex. I couldn't hold it back at the end and scrambled towards the closest trash can to throw up. I ran into an alleyway that led to a dead end and threw open the lid of the nearest trash can. My headache somewhat subsided after I emptied everything I drank that night into that trash can. Slowly but surely, my normal vision returned to me as well. I brushed myself off and got ready to leave the alleyway. I wanted to take a good long nap at home to forget what I'd seen at the club. Maybe then I could actually enjoy the next time I went to the club. I turned around to walk out of the alleyway only to see something that froze me in my tracks. My ex-fiance was standing at the entrance of the alleyway blocking my only exit. She was wearing the same white dress she wore back at the club, but now that my vision was clearer, I could tell it was actually a full-blown wedding dress, the same one she intended to wear at our wedding and the same one she wore when I permanently ended our relationship. You promised me, she said in a raspy voice. You promised, you promised you'd be with me forever. I didn't know what to say or what to do. Panicked, I stumbled backwards and fell with my eyes still fixed on that ghastly visage of a woman I once loved. Pain shot through my body as I landed on the hard cobblestone, but it was nothing compared to the terror that gripped my heart. With no options left, I backed up against the wall of the dead end and closed my eyes. Tears trickled down my cheeks. 
I prayed that I was just on a bad trip from something I took back at the club. I don't know how long I was there, but by the time I finally gathered the courage to open my eyes, it was morning, and my ex fiance was nowhere to be seen. I hurried back to my house that day and went straight to the backyard. I grabbed a shovel from the shed and started digging, determined not to let the memory of my ex-fiancé hold me back from living my life. I told myself that was all she was, a bad memory meant to be forgotten. My drunken mind must have conjured her up back at the club. There was no way it could have been her stalking me at the club because I knew exactly where she was. After all, I was the one who buried her. The blade of my shovel hit something hard within the dirt. I tossed my shovel away and raked away the dirt with my bare hands. Still lying there in the shallow grave I dug months ago was the rotting corpse of my ex-fiancé. She was still wearing the dress she bought for our wedding, though it was riddled with holes made by hundreds of withering worms. Maggots had eaten away most of her head and face, exposing the cracked open skull she got the night I killed her. I breathed a sigh of relief. If she was still here rotting, there was no way it could have been her stalking me out at the club, right? My blood ran cold when I felt the foul breath of something dead and rotting brush against the back of my neck. I didn't dare turn around for fear of what I might find. Although I was holding my dead fiancé with my bare hands, I heard her raspy voice whisper in my ear as if she were right behind me. It was the last thing I would ever hear. Till death do us part. I went to medical school out of grave interest in human anatomy. On the campus of our medical school, we had an adjacent hospital. Sometimes, professors took our anatomy classes in the hospital labs. Due to this, we had direct access to the hospital morgue. Sometimes, we brought several limbs, a pair of brains, or a dissected eye to understand the human body better. The smell of death surpasses every odor in this world. I have witnessed students collapsing on the morgue floor while witnessing embalming or dissection of a particular organ. Slowly, everyone catches up because you know what to expect before choosing this field. But there's this one girl in our batch who never did well around a corpse. For the sake of this story, we'll call her Lizzie. Lizzie was labeled as the scaredy cat of our batch and many ridiculed her for weak nerves. One day, when I went to the cafeteria and saw Lizzie sitting on a corner bench and crying silently, I felt bad for her. So I walked up to her. Hey, are you all right? She quickly wiped her tears and replied in a low voice. Yes, yes, I'm fine. Listen, if you want, I can help you to get better at the practical. You would? But why? Because I know you are good at this. All you need is some little practice. A smile of hope blossomed on her face and she agreed. Since that day after classes, Lizzie and I started to work on our practical skills on a corpse. Sometimes, to make things easier for her, I even instructed her to operate on a dummy first and then go for a real dead body. She started to get better with time. One day, I was going to my room after a practice session with Lizzie when Ben pulled me aside. Ben was the notorious one in our group and always walked around with his two sidekicks, Justin and Tim. Needless to say, he's the one who made fun of Lizzie the most. Having fun with your little girlfriend, huh? We are just good friends, Ben. And it's none of your business anyway. Yeah, yeah, I know. But you know what, pretty boy? You helping her can create a problem for all of us. I didn't understand how helping Lizzie can create problems, so I kept staring at him with a confused face. He came close to me and said, You know, she's already doing great in the theories, and it's almost impossible to beat her there. So? So? If she gets better and practical too, she will be a competitor for the special scholarship program. And you and I both know only two people are going to get that. One can be you and one can be me. Then why bring this extra competition? Be smart, Andrew. If you were so confident that you will get in, then why bother about the number two? You better concentrate on your studies instead of others' achievements. I walked away like a boss and I could see his face turn cold with my unsatisfying reply. He gave me an evil grin and walked away. I knew people like him can only talk, so I ignored it. But I failed to see the bad omen lurking behind all of this. The next day, our professor was teaching us how to do a bypass surgery when Ben pulled a disgusting stunt. 
Lizzie was standing right next to the professor, and she was already a bit grossed out seeing the blood and foul liquids dripping out the disposal bucket. I was standing on the opposite side and assuring her with calm eyes that she is going to be all right. When Ben intentionally tripped on the bucket, making it fly in the air and then landing on Lizzie, all of that disposed of materials mixed with fell all over her face and body. She screamed in terror and started vomiting on the floor for not being able to take the rancid smell. We took her away and I watched a cruel smile sparkling on Ben's face as he stood in the corner and enjoyed the show. Lizzie caught a high fever and missed out on her first practical exam of that semester. I knew he did it intentionally, but there was nothing I could do. A week went by and Lizzie got better and rejoined the classes. We were all sitting in the lab one day when Ben stormed inside with a bunch of other students. Are you all ready for the fun tonight? He yelled in joy. Everyone raised their hands to cheer with him. Ben declared, there's going to be a treasure hunt game tonight, and it's a tradition that everyone must take part in. After dinner, we all gathered in the community hall of the hostel. Three groups were formed, with five members in each. I don't know why, but Ben selected Lizzie on his team. We were handed over clues and directed to find the treasure that had been hidden inside the hostel premises. Every group ran in different directions, following their clue. Lizzie looked at me with a nervous face, and I assured her she'll be okay. Ben's group went to the left and mine to the right. The clues were very kiddish, and it didn't take us much to solve. Our team was walking down the emergency stairs looking for the last and final clue when I overheard a conversation. It was Justin and Tim. Can't wait to see the show tonight. I want to see the look on her face when she finds the treasure. <laughs> Poor Lizzie. Ben is going to scare the hell out of her. Hearing this, I rushed following their voices and found them going to the other side of the building. I grabbed Justin's t-shirt from behind and punched him on the stomach. What the hell is going on? Where's Ben? Let me go. Tell me his evil plan or I will punch you until your guts come out of your mouth. Ben has placed a severed hand under Lizzie's pillow, which is the treasure we're all playing for. Tr trust me, it it's all him. I didn't do anything. He wanted to scare her. That's why he planned this entire hunt. I ran to Lizzie's room. I knew if she gets a shock again, she will probably leave this course and return home. She will lose all hope and her life will be ruined by some jerk. As soon as I reached her room, I saw Ben standing outside her door and trying to listen to what's happening inside. Everyone else was also gathered there and I felt sick seeing them make fun of a traumatized girl. Seeing me rush towards her room, he understood I'm going to bulldoze his bizarre treasure hunt. He jumped on me. Before I could free myself, his two sidekicks grabbed me from behind and pinned me down on the floor. No, no, pretty boy. You're not going to ruin my plan. Just a minute more and it will all be over. Lizzie will win after she finds the treasure. <laughs> Justin and Tim grabbed me tightly. Ben placed his hands on my mouth so I couldn't alarm Lizzie by making any sound. Everything was quiet, and I could hear movements inside the room. I told myself, any minute now. Lizzie is probably heading to her bed, and she is soon to discover a bloody hand under her pillow. Five seconds went by. A minute went by. Five minutes went by, and we didn't hear her scream. By this time, everyone reached near her room and started to rebuke Ben for his disgusting prank. Getting scared by my group, Tim and Justin let me go, and a huge brawl took place. We all bolted inside the room and I screamed. Lizzie, are you? But as we all stepped in the room, we found Lizzie sitting on her bed and munching the flesh of that rotten hand. Her entire mouth was smeared with blood and skin. Maggots were crawling on her lips from that hand. A reeking smell choked the fresh air in the room. Some started vomiting on the floor seeing her as that. And Tim ran away screaming. Ben stood there like a statue. Who knew a stupid treasure hunt will it take such a terrifying turn? I took a step ahead, shaking with fear, and said in a fumbling voice, Liz, what are you doing? Liz, stop it! She looked at me as if she doesn't know who I am. Her eyes were wide, and for the first time, I didn't see any fear in them. She looked back at the hand, and then at Ben. A scary, hungry grin appeared on her face. She slowly got up from the bed and jumped on Ben all of a sudden. Before anyone could stop her, she bit a huge chunk of flesh from Ben's neck and Ben fell on the floor, drowning in his own blood. 
Blood splattered all over the walls and on Lizzie's face. She wiped her face with Ben's blood and started laughing. <laughs> I win! I found the treasure! <laughs> I win! We couldn't save Ben that night. He had heart failure out of shock and fear. Also, he suffered excessive blood loss on his way to the ICU. Lizzie ended up in a mental institution. I still visit her sometimes. It aches my heart how she doesn't recognize me or anyone anymore. She just sits in the corner of her room and hums a creepy tune. She even laughs and giggles on her own and says, I win. I found the treasure. <laughs> I have been working in a Target for a long time. We face all kinds of customers every day, from the over-demanding dad to nagging kids. We try to manage everyone with a smile, but some customers turn out to be completely different from what they appear in the beginning. It was a boring Tuesday night and I was cleaning the store. It was near closing hours when I noticed a woman standing in front of a shelf full of toilet paper. She was nodding her head from left to right and talking to herself in a very weird manner. I was stunned to see her behave like that. I stopped working and stood there in awe. She suddenly turned back and said, Melissa, don't you have work to do? Um, I, I am sorry, ma'am. I turned around awkwardly and started mopping the floor again. It took me a second to realize what just happened. Wait a minute, how did she know my name? I don't even know her and I'm pretty sure this is the first time we are meeting in person. I looked at her with a confused face and said, Ma'am, how do you know my name? She didn't reply, just stood there like before. I went to her and touched her shoulder when she suddenly broke free from her transient state and looked at me as if this is the first time she's seen me. Can you please tell me where I will get the toilet paper? Ma'am, you are standing right next to them. She looked up at the stacked rolls of toilet paper and got extremely embarrassed. I could see in her eyes that all this time standing there she didn't even notice these roles. It was as if all this time she was in a different world. I asked her again, ma'am, you didn't tell me. How do you know my name? What? I don't know your name. What are you saying? You just called me by my name. I don't even have a name tag. Ma'am, are you feeling all right? Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to finish shopping and uh, go home. I am sorry if I startled you. The woman grabbed some toilet rolls and threw them in her cart. I could tell from her body language that she is aware of her weirdness and she is trying to hide something at the same time. As soon as she went out of my sight, I felt the urge to keep an eye on her. I secretly followed her. She walked past the hardware section and went to the clothing department. At that moment, there were hardly three to four people in the store. The clothing section was completely empty. The woman was going through boys' t-shirts like a normal person. I started organizing the shelves nearby and observed her with the corner of my eye. Three minutes went by and she didn't do anything weird like before. I kind of lost my interest thinking it was all just a coincidence. I might have taken five to six steps when I heard a chuckle. As I looked back, I met with a disgusting sight. She was pulling her own hair and chewing it like crazy. The way she was eating her own strands of hair made me shudder in disgust. Saliva was drooling from her mouth and her eyes were moving around like crazy. I couldn't wait and watch her going on like this. I rushed to the counter and called my coworker explaining this emergency situation. By the time I reached near the counter, I saw other customers leaving and Paul locking the main entrance. Don't, there's someone in here. What? Tell them we are past closing hours. No, you are not getting it. There's something very wrong with her. You need to come with me. The usual routine was to lock the main entrance after 10 p.m. and leave for home using the back door. Paul and I have worked many shifts together and we were the ones who left the store last. I escorted him to the clothing section where I saw the woman last time. There was no one else in the store and Paul was getting anxious to leave as well. What is it, Melissa? There's no one here. No, I just saw her right here. She was eating her own hair. I'm telling you, 
there was something wrong with her. Look, I don't have time for all this. Let's make a quick round around the store and leave. I have a date to go to. We started searching the store. Paul was walking casually while I searched for that woman frantically. I even called out to her. Ma'am, where are you? We are about to close the store. Please come out. But no sign of her. We came back to the entrance. I still couldn't shake off that memory of seeing her chewing her hair when I heard a gasping sound. My eyes went to Paul, who was standing right beside me. I noticed his face turning pale with an unknown fear. His eyes were stuck at something ahead of us. As I followed his eyes, I found that same woman standing in front of us. But this time, there was definitely something wrong with her. Her eyes were turned inside her head, revealing the white area. It was so scary for that moment, it felt like she had no eyeballs. She was breathing heavily while making a groaning sound. I whispered to Paul in a low voice, She's the one I was talking about. Paul took a step ahead and said in a fumbling voice, uh, Ma'am, um, are you all right? Should we call for an ambulance? She didn't reply and then smiled at us in the eeriest way possible. I took out my phone and started dialing paramedics because it was clear by then that this woman is not in the best shape. I was about to make the call when the woman started to choke. She was choking on the air and gagging in pain. It was as if something is stuck in her throat. Her gags soon transformed into horrible coughing, and Paul and I just stood there cluelessly. We had no idea what was happening to her, and we were so much taken aback by this terrible sight that we forgot to act on it. She slowly crouched down on the floor while coughing and gagging. Oh my God, she's about to vomit, Paul said in disgust. But what happened afterwards, none of us expected to see. The woman shoved her index finger inside her mouth and started to pull something out of her throat. It was a freaky, scary sight to watch. After a few seconds of suffering like this, something actually started to come out of her mouth. Once she took her fingers from her mouth, we saw what it was. Believe me or not, that woman pulled out almost a ball of hair strands from her throat. Yes, all that hair she ate back then, she pulled it out from her stomach. I can't tell you how slimy and filthy it all looked. But there we were, watching this awful scene like statues. After discharging a pile of saliva-covered hairballs from her mouth, she got up and turned to Paul. Her inverted eyes turned back to their normal shape and she said, Please, help me. She's trying to replace me. Who? What do you mean? Paul asked her, but before she could reply, something inside of her started to break her bones from within. Her body was bending upwards and downwards, sideways and in every direction possible, like crazy while her bones snapped. It was a scene from an exorcist movie, and we had no idea what the hell was going on with her. I didn't wait anymore and called the paramedics. Paul screamed in fear as neither of us were able to witness this woman turning into a vegetable with her bones breaking one after the other. By the time the paramedics reached us, she was lying on the floor, wrapped and folded like a garbage bag and barely breathing. Her eyes were popped from its sockets with enormous pain and fear. Even though she was taken to the hospital, she couldn't be saved. Paul took a leave to get his shit together and didn't discuss a word about that woman or that night to anyone. But I couldn't just let this matter go. A few days later, I went to the hospital she was being taken to and asked a nurse about her. I had to give quite a description of her condition as the nurse recognized. Oh, you mean Miss Ruby? Yeah, it was bound to happen anyway. I obviously got pretty shocked with that kind of reply and asked, what, why are you saying that? The nurse told me she knew this woman from her neighborhood. Ruby lived close to her house. She had no family and was on her own, and she worked as a medium in seances. The nurse also told me her profession took a huge toll on her, and that in her last seance, she got very sick as the spirit denied going back. I understood why she said someone is trying to replace her that night. All her spooky behaviors were the result of being possessed. I don't know if all that is true, or she was just a very sick individual. But trust me, the way Paul and I witnessed her bones breaking, it has to be some evil force lurking inside her at that moment. There's no human on earth who can break his or her own bones like that. Often at night, I woke up imagining those snapping sounds and her gagging voice trying to ask for help as the uninvited guest took over her body. I have always been a gamer. No matter what you name, be it online or offline, I have played it or yet to play it. 
Among the online games, Minecraft became my recent favorite. After my elder brother moved out for college, his gaming console became mine. Mostly I played with my friends, Tim and Jude. I was sitting in my room and playing with Tim one afternoon when Jude called me. I picked up saying, hey man, what's up? He told me his distant cousin is inviting him to join a survival mode. It's going to be a big game and would I care to join? I haven't played with a lot of players till then, so I agreed happily. Jude told me he will send a server link, which I'll have to join. Almost every gamer knows joining unknown servers holds its own risk, but we anyway do it, right? I didn't hesitate much because I never expected things to take a different turn. Jude sent me the link. I joined it immediately. We thought it would be better to send commands and chat separately, so everyone opened the MindChat website to play the game without getting overflowed by messages on the same screen. It was a team of 10 players, and I only knew Jude and Tim. The game began, and the red warning logo flashed on the screen, revealing we were going to play the hardcore mode. Everyone played carefully, because if you die in hardcore mode, you either become a spectator or leave the server. I played many times on this mode, and not lying, I got pretty good at it. I started building a shelter while Tim and Jude gathered stones for a furnace. Everyone was doing their gameplay except one player. This guy named his character Creeper00 and stood like a statue right next to me. I felt as if he was just standing there only to watch what I am doing. The character was behaving like a mob for no reason and was sneaking on me. Wherever I went, he followed me. And if I stopped, he stopped as well. I was feeling irritated, so I asked in the mind chat, Yo, Creeper00, what's your problem, dude? To which he replied with a victory sign. Tim also texted, Who is this guy, Jude? And Jude replied, I don't know. Let's play our game. I went back to the screen and started playing again. We played for hours and it was time for sunset. Tim and Jude hid in the shelter and I drifted apart while collecting wood. I started to run in the direction of the shelter because I was scared of the zombies. I mean, you can't take unnecessary risks when you're in hardcore mode. After running for at least five minutes, when I still didn't find my shelter, I texted in the chat. Guys, where are you? I think I'm lost. But instead of Tim or Jude, the creeper guy replied, You're not alone. I am right behind you. I checked the game screen, but still found myself standing alone. Just then, another message popped up in the mind chat from the same creeper 00. I am right behind you. Turn around. Trust me. Every inch of my skin shivered in fear. I was alone in the house, and I knew this guy was just messing with me, but at that moment, my heartbeat got faster. I quickly turned around and obviously found no one. I checked the chat again and found everyone either died or left the game, and it was just me and that creeper guy in the game. I texted, where did everyone go? Tim, Jude, where are you guys? The creeper guy again replied, I ate your friends so that we can be friends. I have had enough of this bullshit. I called Jude right then, but he didn't receive my call. I dialed Tim's phone after that. He also didn't answer. I got a bit spooked out now. I texted in the chat. Okay, enough of your jokes. I'm living the game. Now, die alone. The reply came quite spontaneously. Don't you dare quit on me. I killed everyone so that we can stay together. You better, but I didn't wait to listen to this crazy guy. I quit the game and turned off the PC. I sat in front of the black screen of the computer for some time and then got up. I went to the washroom, splashed water on my face, and jumped on my bed. This is why I often avoided playing with unknown players. I shouldn't have joined the server in the first place. I might have dozed off thinking all this when my phone buzzed. I woke up and saw it was mom. As I picked up, she screamed at me saying, Luke, are you home? Yeah, where will I go now? Then why is the door alarm going off? What? There's no sound of an alarm going off. W what are you saying? Luke, there's an intruder in our house. Someone has entered the house breaking the alarm. I just got notified. I've called 911. Please, lock the door of your room and stay inside. As soon as I heard her say that, I heard another sound. Someone was coming upstairs in a hurry. I could hear heavy footsteps rushing towards the door of my room. I sprung out of bed and probably some inches away from my door with the door jilted open slightly. But before the person on the other side could open it completely and enter my room, 
I grabbed the doorknob and pushed with all my strength to close the door. I could feel extra pressure from the opposite side, but I somehow closed the door and locked it. Whoever you are, you won't get in. My mom is going to be home soon, and we have called the cops as well. <laughs> but why did you quit on me? As I heard these lines, a cold shiver ran down my spine. Is it Creeper Zero Zero? How did he know my address? Oh shit, he tracked my IP. Damn! You definitely don't want to be my friend. Then why don't I send you to the same place where your friends are now? What did you do to them? I ate their hearts and gave the remains to the zombies. <laughs> What? You are just a crazy Minecraft freak. He went on twisting the doorknob for a few minutes more while laughing and growling like a maniac. I got so terrified that I sat on the floor and covered my ears with my hands. I was praying to God for the cops to arrive soon, and God did listen to me. As soon as the cop cars reached the house, I heard running footsteps fading away. The cops rescued me, and someone indeed broke our alarm and entered the house. I still don't know who was the other person on the other side of the door. My friends, Tim and Jude, disappeared from their houses all of a sudden. Police are still searching for them. No one has the slightest idea what happened to them. I don't want to believe that, some guy named Creeper from Minecraft actually ate my friends with his zombie clan. But will you believe me if I tell you something completely bizarre? These days, whenever I open Minecraft, no matter which mode I play or what level I'm on, three characters are always present there, standing in the corner, watching me. Their names read Tim, Jude, and Creeper00. My best friend John and I were invited to a house party across the state one night. We didn't know the host very well, but we didn't care. We were stressed out college students and it seemed like a good opportunity to relax and blow off steam. John had a van that we used to bring four other friends to the party with. We drove the entire three hour ride there without incident. Once we got there, we partied hard. I downed well over a dozen cups of beer with my friends. John hadn't planned on drinking much, so that he could be our designated driver, but after a little peer pressure from a cute girl at the party, he caved in and started drinking and dancing with the rest of us. I'm pretty sure we did some club drugs too during our time there, but I was way too drunk to remember most of it. By the end of it, I could barely walk, and John was more than a little tipsy. Once it was clear that the party was coming to a close, we decided to take our leave together. John insisted that he be the one to drive his own van during the trip back. I told him that it was a bad idea for him to be driving in his state, but he insisted that he was fine and will be fine after a few minutes. I wanted to protest, but I was too drunk and tired myself to argue. It's not like I had any other way to get back home anyways, and besides, he was the most sober of us, even if that wasn't saying much. Since I was the drunkest out of the six of us, I was given the back seat of the van all to myself so that I could lie down and rest. I passed out almost immediately as my head touched the soft cushion of the back seat. When I woke up, I noticed that the van was slowing down. I pulled myself up to sit and wipe the drool from the corner of my lips. What's up? Why are we slowing down? I asked, still groggy from the alcohol in my system. We're picking up a hitchhiker. John slurred, clearly still a bit drunk. I was going to tell him that it was a terrible idea to pick up a hitchhiker in the middle of the night, or during any time of the day for that matter. But then, I saw the hitchhiker holding out their thumb for myself through the backseat window. She was a slender young woman, and a pretty one at that. Her skin was bone white and her hair was long and dark. She looked like she'd just gotten out of a funeral in her pitch black dress with her lips fixed into a frown. John took a second to tidy up his hair and check his breath, which undoubtedly smelled like alcohol, before lowering the driver's side window. 
Hey, miss, do you need a lift? He asked, while flashing the hitchhiker the most charming smile he could muster. I didn't hear her reply, but I chalked it up to her voice being too soft for my dulled senses to catch. She must have said yes, though, because John unlocked the van for her right away. With the other seats taken, she ended up joining me in the back seat. She sat down beside me but didn't bother to buckle her seatbelt. Seeing her up close, it really did look like she was sad about something. With the way that she was dressed, I could only assume that she had just lost a loved one and got stranded on the way back from the funeral. I wanted to cheer her up so I decided to make polite conversation with her. So, where are you headed? She turned to me and opened her mouth to speak. I could see her lips moving to form words, but for some reason I couldn't hear a word of what she said. John must have heard her just fine though. I think that's a couple of hours away from here, John said in reply to whatever she said that I couldn't hear. We could pick up a snack for ourselves there too. Anyone want anything? My other friends started listing off the pit stop foods that they were craving. Hot dogs, burgers, fries, the typical drunk food. They all apparently heard the pale girl say her destination too. I don't know why I couldn't hear her, but I was also too tired and hung over to care. I just leaned on the car door and waited for my headache to go away. We continued driving down the road for a couple of hours. In all that time, my friends all made conversation with the pale girl beside me. However, I didn't hear her utter a single word during my entire ride. She would just move her lips in silence, and my friends would pretend like they heard her say something. My eyes were about to flutter shut when we arrived at the pit stop. In our inebriated state, none of us noticed the truck coming out of the pit stop until it was too late. I saw the white flash of headlights and felt a sudden shockwave erupt throughout the van. We crashed head on into the truck. My legs were crushed by the seat in front of me and pain flooded my mind and I passed out. When I finally came to, the pale girl was no longer beside me and in front of me were the mangled and bloodied bodies of my friends. They were all dead their bones crushed by the jagged metal of the car after impact. The girl in front of me had her head completely caved in by stray debris from the truck that hit us, splattering the contents of her skull all over me. I vomited into the seat beside me and saw the pale hitchhiker standing outside without a scratch on her. She gave me one last mournful glance before walking away. I don't know if it was just my pain-addled mind playing tricks on me, but I could have sworn I saw my mutilated friends following behind her. Before they all disappeared into the night, John, with his intestines hanging from a gaping hole in his stomach, turned towards me and mouthed, I'm sorry, before following the hitchhiker into the darkness. I looked in front of the truck and saw the corpses of my friends still where they were when they died. John was pinned to the front seat by the grill of the truck that crashed into us. His mushed up organs littered the floor of the van. I've lost both of my legs in that accident. The police insist that there was no sign of the pale hitchhiker my friends and I met that night. Not surprising, I suppose. If she is who I think she is, I'll meet her again someday. Just like everyone else eventually. Maybe next time. I'll finally be able to hear her voice. Three of my friends and I were bored out of our minds one Saturday night. Our college exam week had just ended, and we all needed something to do to take our minds off what our grades could be. We were all playing video games at my place when one of my friends, Jeff, received a notification from his phone. Someone he followed on Twitter just posted an announcement for a house party not so far away from where we were. When I asked Jeff who the host was, he just shrugged. I don't know, he said. She looked cute, so I followed her like, I don't know, last month? I didn't really pay attention. None of us were surprised. Jeff had a well-known weakness for pretty faces. Still, we thought his raging hormones might have been a good thing for once. We were all bored, and a house party sounded like just the type of mindless fun we needed to ease our anxieties about college. Before we left, I grabbed my emergency inhaler from my bedroom. 
I had pretty bad asthma, so I kept an inhaler for it with me at all times whenever I went outside. I pocketed my inhaler and joined my friends in a carpool to the house party. On the way there, it was decided that I'd be the group's designated driver. I wasn't too fond of alcohol in the first place, so I was content just to hang out with my friends and maybe chat up a few girls if the opportunity presented itself. I drove us for a good hour or so with Jeff giving me directions before he told me to stop the car. I parked the car near a gigantic house that stood alone at the end of the neighborhood street. Looking slightly confused, Jeff told us that was where the party was being held according to the Twitter post. Seeing what the house actually looked like worried us a bit at first. Sure, it was a big place. In fact, it'd be a perfect place to throw a house party. However, it seemed eerily quiet from the outside. Not a single ray of light peeked through its closed red curtains and we couldn't hear any of the usual noises you'd hear at a party like drunken laughter or dance music. Everything was just silent. Not even the sound of crickets in the grass dared to break the quiet. For a moment there, we were worried that we'd been tricked or Jeff got us lost. After double and then triple checking the address posted in the Twitter announcement, we concluded that we were at the right address and also that the party was probably a prank. Maybe the poster wanted to mess with the owner of the house by announcing the house party at their place. Or perhaps they were just trying to waste the time of anyone who wanted to attend the non-existent party. Whatever the case, we were ready to leave and go get pizza or something. We would have done just that if Jeff hadn't insisted on knocking on the house door first. We knew it was a bad idea, but my friends and I also knew that we'd never hear the end of it from Jeff if we refused. So we relented and followed him to the front door of the house to see if anyone was inside. Upon arriving at the front door, I picked up a faint metallic scent that lingered in the air, like copper that had been left to rust. Jeff knocked on the large door three times and waited for a response. We didn't hear any noise come from inside, but the door opened only seconds later. In an instant, our eyes were bombarded with an array of flashing multicolored lights, followed by loud thumping dance music. The metallic scent from before gave way to the familiar smell of cheap alcohol and greasy pizza. Greeting us at the door was the girl who announced the house party on Twitter in an outfit that left very little to the imagination. She greeted us with a wide smile and escorted us inside. Behind the closed curtains of the house was a house party, just like any other I'd been to. She told us to make ourselves at home and handed us all red solo cups filled to the brim with alcohol. Since I was planning on driving my friends back home, I set mine down on a nearby table. Jeff shot us in, I told you so look, before running off to chase some skirts. For a while, everything was great. My friends had fun drinking and eating the food on offer while I talked to some new people. The curtains always remained closed, but I never thought to question it. As the night went on, the metallic scent from before returned. I didn't mind it too much. It wasn't a pleasant smell, but then again, I've smelled worse things at parties. I just assumed that someone must have gotten a nosebleed or forgot their tampons or something. At some point, I started to feel my asthma act up, probably because I was exerting myself too much while dancing. It wasn't anything a huff from my inhaler couldn't fix though. I shook my inhaler, put it to my mouth and squeezed out its contents. My eyes were closed as I inhaled the chemical cocktail. I counted to 10, like I'd done a million times before, and exhaled my breath. The stiffness in my chest alleviated as the medicine did its thing. I opened my eyes again with plans to continue partying. Instead, I was met with a nightmarish fleshscape. I was no longer standing in a house, or if it was a house, it was one that came straight from hell. The walls were made of red pulsating flesh that expanded and contracted in rhythmic unison as if the house itself were breathing. The floors were carpeted by a layer of pink, watery muscle that squished under my feet like a soft tongue. Where there once was a door was instead two rows of vertical teeth that were tightly clasped against one another. That wasn't the worst part, though. There were still people in the house. Partygoers were dancing and drinking to throbbing music that was, in reality, just the sound of the living house breathing in and out. They all appeared to be half digested, with many of them missing huge chunks of flesh from their faces and torsos, exposing white bones and revealing empty holes where their organs were supposed to be. It was as if they'd been eaten away by acid from the inside out. None of them seemed to notice that they were missing most of their bodies. 
They just kept dancing to the sound of the living, breathing house on its carpet of flesh as bits of their own flesh fell off. Hundreds of long, limp tubes that looked like large intestines dangled from the organic ceiling like hanging vines. Oblivious partygoers grabbed the tubes and put it to their mouths to drink green acidic bile that was being pumped through them by the house. In their minds, they must have been drinking beer from red solo cups, not knowing that they were digesting themselves for the house's meal. The faint metallic copper scent I picked up when I arrived here has become overpowering since I learned the true form of this house. If I had to venture a guess, the source of that copper scent must be the same thing causing everyone to hallucinate that they were at a normal house party. Whatever chemicals were in my inhaler must have countered the effects of the living house's hallucinogens. It's not like that did me much good though. There are no windows here. The only way in or out was the grinding teeth that comprised the doorway. I tried to pry it open, but it was hard for me to even hold onto the teeth with the slippery saliva covering it. After a while, my vision would blur. The hallucinogens would kick in, and I'd suddenly be transported back to a regular house party where people were having fun and everything was right in the world. I'd have to take another puff of my inhaler to pull myself back to a horrid reality whenever I did, and those moments of brutal clarity were becoming shorter and shorter each time. I've been stuck here for hours trying to find a way out. Puffing my inhaler only gives me a few minutes away from the house's illusions now. But at this point, I welcome the hallucinations. I just took the last puff from my inhaler. Soon, I'll be permanently taken back to the illusion crafted by the house. I hope I'll assume that everything I just saw was just some elaborate waking nightmare and not the truth I know it to be. Ignorance is bliss after all. This happened when I was 10 years old. My dad took me and my cousin to Disneyland. Tom was maybe a year or two older than me. Even though we were cousins, he often cared for me like a big brother. That was our first time in Disneyland, hence we got blown up entering the fairy tale world. There were exciting rides everywhere, with all the Disney themes set up. We were so much overflown with joy that we got confused about where to start from. Tom and I were huge fans of science and tech stuff, so without wasting a second, we rushed to Tomorrowland. Every ride was full of fun. Other than that, we ate as much junk food as we could. That one day, Dad said yes to almost everything. We spent a huge amount of time scavenging the entire park as much as we could. To catch our breath, we sat on a bench near Alice in Wonderland. Dad got us ice cream, and it was a perfect weekend in the best way possible. I was enjoying my chocolate cone while looking around, trying to grab as much beauty as I could of that place, when Tom's voice broke my concentration. You know, there's a haunted mansion that is still said to be cursed. What? The sun was long gone. The entire Disneyland was glowing and dark, and Tom's words started to spook me out. I never enjoyed talking about ghosts and stuff. I still don't. Tom smiled and said, You don't know the story? What story? The one about the crying kid. No. Why? What happened? People say there was a woman who came to visit the haunted mansion with her little son on his birthday. The son fell in love with that place and wished to revisit it on his next birthday. But before he could, he died due to some unknown reasons. I stopped him, saying, But he didn't die here. Then how come this place is cursed? Well, you didn't let me finish, idiot. Keep quiet and listen. Tom went on. Next year on his birthday, the mother came back with the little boy's ashes, and it's said that she scattered them inside the haunted mansion so the boy's soul can live forever. Since then, people visiting the haunted mansion after dark keep hearing the cry of a little boy inside that mansion. Some say he's still there. Jeez! Tom stood up laughing, seeing me spooked out just by a crow. I looked up and saw the night sky above. The crowd was getting thinner around us. My dad called out and said we have an hour more to do whatever we want. Then we'll be heading home. He went to grab a drink and Tom said, Let's check out the haunted mansion. Honestly, I would have not hesitated before. But after that creepiest story, I started having second thoughts. Seeing me pondering like that, 
Tom chuckled, saying, <laughs> I didn't know you were such a chicken. Shut up. I'm scared of nothing. Then let's go. I noticed my dad walking away. I then looked back at Tom. He stood there with you're such a kid face, if that makes any sense, but whatever it was, he knew his story freaked me out. But eventually, I decided to man up and go with him. There weren't many people around the haunted mansion. As we were about to enter, we only saw a crew member standing near the door. Welcome to the last ride of the day. The woman smiled and opened the front door for us. It was ironic enough that I am already freaking out by a crazy story and about to hop onto the last show of the night. The Haunted Mansion is a dark ride attraction. It features a ride-through tour in Omni-Mover vehicles called Doom Buggies, and a walk-through show is displayed to riders waiting in the line queue. As we entered the mansion through a doorway, we reached into the foyer, lit by a large, flickering, cobweb-covered chandelier and surrounding candelabras. The lighting and sound effects made me feel like I'd been taken back to the times of Count Dracula. Suddenly, a deep, resonant voice of an invisible spirit started speaking. When hinges creak in doorless chambers, and strange and frightening sounds echo through the halls. Whenever candle lights flicker, where the air is deathly still, this is the time when ghosts are present, practicing their terror with ghoulish delight. Oh, this is gonna be fun, Tom exclaimed in joy. A pair of sliding doors opened, and after entering, we found ourselves in one of two similar octagonal rooms, which are large, slow-moving elevators with two sets of walls, the lower of which does not reach the ceiling. This room has very dim lights, making the entire setup quite scary. There were paintings hung on those walls, and the sound effect going on. To take a closer look at the painting on the wall right next to me, I leaned on the wall. I was staring at the painting when a hand grabbed my t-shirt and pulled me. Without turning in that direction, I said in an irritated voice, I'm coming, Tom, just let me look around a bit. But he again pulled my t-shirt, and I turned back to yell at him for irritating me when I found myself standing alone in that room. Tom? Tom? I'm here! Hurry up, the ride is about to start! Turning a corner, I entered the load area where a seemingly endless stream of black carriages known as doom buggies descended one staircase and ascended another. Beyond the track, clouds drift past a limbo of boundless mist and decay. I saw Tom standing near the doom buggies with another crew member. Where were you? Come on, let's go. Did you pull my t-shirt back there? What? Seems like you're seeing ghosts everywhere, huh? I didn't argue anymore and hopped in. I just wanted to get out of that place as soon as possible. I sat behind Tom and the ride took off. The pace of those rides were quite slow. It was made for the riders to enjoy the spooky events happening around them for a certain period. We were moving through a seamlessly endless hallway, decorated with various jump scares and ghostly settings on both sides. I heard Tom laughing like he is too old to be scared with such stupid props. I didn't say anything just kept quiet and waited for the journey to come to an end. The doom buggies continued down a corridor of doors. The sound of pounding, shrieking, calls for help, screams, knocking, and maniacal laughter could be heard from behind the doors. Knockers and handles were moving like crazy. I don't want to be here. Come on, it's all sound effects. Relax. After leaving that area, we entered a dark room decorated with objects of witchcraft. A witch's head appeared within a misty crystal ball with blue hair, and it started to flow in the air while she incanted in a creepy voice. Serpents and spiders, the tale of a rat. Call in the spirits wherever they're at. Rap on a table, it's time to respond. Send us a message from somewhere beyond. The computerized voice was about to say more, when the entire mansion has power cut. The sounds paused and the ride stopped with a quick jerk, and Tom and I sat in the pitch black hallway. My god, what do we do now? I screamed in fear. Tom, who was making fun of me all this time, started to freak out too. Hello? 
Someone here? Please help us, the ride is stuck. He kept calling the crew members for help, but no one turned up. We got up and started to walk towards the exit like a blind man makes his way. Tom walked ahead of me, and I followed him hearing his footsteps. We stretched our arms trying to find our way out when we heard a cry. It was a kid crying in pain. Trust me, I never heard anything more haunting than that cry. Tom grabbed my hand and said, Damn, why is your hand so cold? What? What are you saying? I don't feel your hands on me. Then, whose hand did I just hold? Without letting him finish, the lights came back and I saw a young boy standing right between us. His face had no flesh. The white skeleton with empty sockets looked at the ceiling and then whimpered in a low tone. As our eyes shifted to the front wall, we saw large mirrors on those walls. Tom and I were seen in those mirrors, but the skeleton kid had no reflection. It was a terrifying realization for both of us. We screamed at the top of our lungs and started to run towards the exit. Within a few seconds, two crew members were seen running to us. I broke into tears grabbing one of them, while Tom fainted on the floor. Later that night when we came home, we didn't say anything to our parents. Our parents still know that two kids got scared during a power cut inside the haunted mansion of Disneyland. I used to work as a live-in nanny for a rich family. The parents were away on business trips, so their two children would often be in my sole care for months on end. Unlike what snooty rich kids on countless TV shows would have you believe, the kids I cared for were very well behaved. They were twins, one girl and one boy. The boy was named James, while the girl was named Judy. They were both a bit quieter than most kids their age should be, but I just chalked it up to them being introverts. One day, as I was cleaning the hallways of the mansion, I heard the two of them giggling in their bedroom. I didn't think much of it at the time and assumed they were probably just watching a funny video or something. Later that day, during dinner, I asked the twins what they were laughing about in their room. We were playing Mr. Yellowtooth, Judy said with a smile. He's always so funny, James added. I raised an eyebrow at their words, but quickly brushed it off. It wasn't uncommon for kids around their age to have imaginary friends, so it wasn't too unusual. I just never took them for the type to have one. He sounds like a nice fellow, I said, playing along. What's he like? He's really tall and thin, James said. Even his fingers are long, like noodles. But he's got a really big gray head to fit all of his yellow teeth, Judy added. They're all really pointy, too. When he smiles, you can see all of them in his mouth. He looks so funny when he smiles. I tried to imagine Mr. Yellowtooth in my head, but their description and the image that came to my mind was anything but funny. Still, I knew kids could be weirded sometimes. It's not my place to judge what their sense of humor deems funny or creepy. Later that day in the evening, I was cleaning the house after the kids had gone to bed when I heard a sound come from the basement. It was the twins' voice again. They were giggling with each other about something. I didn't leave alone this time, though. My employers, their parents, had told me not to go into the basement due to the issue with the structural integrity. I didn't want to get hurt or sick playing in there, so I opened the basement door and called their names. James? Judy? Are you two in there? The giggling abruptly stopped. When no one answered, I walked down the basement stairs. Each wooden step creaked under my weight. I thought that it would give way under me for a few moments, but I managed to reach the bottom of the stairs without issue. There I saw James and Judy standing with their hands behind their backs, their gaze fixed on the floor. Kids, I said calmly, what are you doing here? You know your parents don't want you in here for your own safety. I'm sorry, Miss Jenny, Judy said. It's just... And Mr. Yellowtooth told us to come here and play. Yeah, James confirmed. He promised to let us visit his home if we come down to the basement. Well, Mr. Yellowtooth will just have to play by himself today, I told them. You two should be in bed by now anyways. 
But Mr. Yellowtooth will be mad if we don't play with him tonight, James said. He gets kind of scary when he's lonely, Judy added in a soft voice. Don't worry, I assured them. I'll talk to Mr. Yellowtooth myself now, so you two head straight to bed, okay? Okay, okay Miss Jenny. Jenny. I watched as the twins walked up the cricket stairs out of the basement. I couldn't help but smile. They were a little odd, but they were good kids. If I ever had my own, I'd want them to be like James and Judy. Once they left the basement, I pulled out my phone and started scrolling. I'd planned to stay there for about a minute to sell the illusion that I was talking to their imaginary friend. But just as I was about to leave, I heard a creak come from somewhere within the dark basement. I used the light on my phone screen to illuminate the area. To my surprise, I saw a trap door right in the middle of the basement that I could have sworn wasn't there before. My curiosity won over and I approached the trap door. As soon as I got near to it, the trap door popped open and a long gray arm with dirty yellowed nails sprung from it to grab my ankle. I didn't have time to react and could only muster a shill scream as it dragged me inside the trap door. I felt my back hit something hard like wood. When I looked up to see what had grabbed me, I saw what the twins had described earlier that day. It was Mr. Yellowtooth, though he was a thousand times more grotesque than I'd imagined him. His body and limbs were stick thin so much that it should have been impossible for him to have any organs. And yet, he had a disproportionately bulbous head that his scrawny body shouldn't have been able to support. I screamed and kicked him hard in his bony shin. Surprisingly, it worked, and he toppled over onto the ground. His grip on my ankle released as he struggled to bring himself back up, and I made a run for it. I was in a large house that looked exactly like the one I just left, but the walls were dirty and covered in reddish brown stains that gave off a stale, coppery stench. I ran past where the kitchen should be, hoping to find some sort of knife to defend myself with. I found one lying on an empty cutting board beside a boiling pot on the stove, though there were no ingredients around to cook with. After grabbing the knife, I turned around and waited beside the open doorway to the kitchen for Mr. Yellowtooth to walk in. As soon as he scuttered into the kitchen to look for me, I brought the knife down on his oversized head. He turned his head towards me just in time for the blade of the knife to bury itself in his left eye. The inhuman thing let out a loud scream of agony, though the smile never left his face. I let go of the knife handle and pushed past him out of the kitchen while he was busy trying to get it out of his eye. I ran to where the twins' bedroom should have been and locked the door behind me. It looked almost exactly like the twins' actual room in the real house, albeit a lot dirtier. In my panic, I scrambled into the wardrobe to hide. I stuffed myself in and closed the door. I leaned back in the wardrobe hoping to make myself scarce. The moment I did, the wooden panel behind me gave way and I fell backwards. For the second time that day, I felt my back hit a hard wooden floor, but I wasn't in that dirty house anymore. I was looking up at the familiar ceiling of the twins' bedroom, and when I turned my gaze to look at where I'd fallen through, I merely saw their open wardrobe. Miss Jenny? I heard Judy say within the room. She sat up on her bed and rubbed her eyes before looking at me with confusion on her face. What are you doing here? What did Mr. Yellowtooth say? I still work as a nanny in that house, though the twins have thankfully stopped talking about Mr. Yellowtooth. I guessed I must have left quite an impression with the knife to his eyeball. Every now and then I'd still hear scratching coming from the basement, but I kept it locked up at all times and put the keys somewhere the twins can't reach. A part of me knows I should be afraid, but after a couple of restless nights, I've come to realize that they were probably a reason why Mr. Yellowtooth was targeting the kids, because he can't target anyone else. I guess that's what monsters really are in the end. Cowards who pick on those who are weaker than them to make themselves feel stronger. Supernatural monster or not, I'm never letting Mr. Yellowtooth 
get near my twins ever again. Near the end of my final school year, the quiet kid in my class held a house party and invited everyone in our grade for it. We all thought it was out of character for him, but we also weren't about to turn down a chance to raise hell at someone else's house. Most of us guessed that he probably wanted to throw one last hurrah before we all had to enter the cruel and boring world of adulthood. I wasn't particularly interested, but my friends wanted to go so, I decided to tag along anyways. We arrived at the house while the party was in full swing. Kids from the entire grade were dancing to the music and downing beers like it was water. The house was gigantic, so there was plenty of space for the hundred odd students to mingle around. The quiet kid who hosted the party, Tim I think his name was, stood chatting with some other kids I didn't recognize like it was the most natural thing in the world. I'd had never seen him like that before. None of us did. All throughout high school, we all knew him as the kid who kept to himself and ate lunch alone at the cafeteria. He even had a few bullies who made his life hell almost every single day. Stealing his lunch money, locking him in lockers, tripping him whenever he walked past them in the hall, that sort of thing. I was surprised to find that those very same bullies were also at the party. The ringleader, Biff, was with his usual posse, forcing some kid to do a keg stand. Why Tim would invite that asshole, I had no idea. But I wasn't one to judge. My friends and I danced to the sound of blaring techno and played a game of beer pong that left us barely able to stand. However, I noticed that Tim himself never engaged in any of it. He didn't drink any beer or bust any moves on the dance floor. He just leaned against the quiet corner of his own house, watching people he barely knew trash it to bits. I got the feeling that he must have thrown the party more for the classmates who barely acknowledged his existence than for himself. I was right, in a way. As the night drew to a close, Tim addressed the party for the first time with a loudspeaker. Hey, everyone. He held up two bottles of very expensive looking whiskey that he must have nicked from his parents' liquor cabinet. Who wants a taste of some of the good shit? Line up and bring your cups. The party goers scrambled towards him with their red solo cups outstretched, eager to know what genuinely good booze tasted like. Near the very front of the line was Biff himself, who smiled smugly as Tim poured him his drink. For some reason, it seemed like Tim gave Biff far more of the stuff than he did everybody else. At the time, I assumed that he was trying to give Biff the extra booze as a peace offering between them. I wouldn't have minded a taste myself, but I was far too drunk already, so instead, I made my way to the nearest couch and laid back. My half-closed eyes still watched the party unfold around me with only a passing interest. But before drunken unconsciousness could take me, I noticed something odd about the party. The movements of the people dancing were much more sluggish than before, as if they were moving through water. And judging by the ill look on their faces, it wasn't just the alcohol in my system making me see things. Biff was the first one to kill over. His face turned pale white and a stream of vomit burst from his mouth. What, what's happening? He gurgled before falling on the floor face first in his own vomit. The rest of the party soon followed with people vomiting and falling to the floor left and right. But as everyone was either panicking or dropping onto the floor themselves, Tim simply watched it all happen from his corner with a serene smile on his face. It was then that I realized that he never drank any of the whiskey himself. It wasn't long before people started accusing him for what was happening. You did this, didn't you? shouted one of Biff's friends who was also doubled over in pain himself. What did you do? Tim didn't answer. He simply walked over to the guy, pulled a pistol from under his shirt, and shot him in the head. The guy crumpled backwards onto the floor with a quarter-sized hole in his forehead. I actually felt his still warm blood trickle around my shoes. The entire house erupted into chaos as Tim coldly and methodically shot down anyone who hadn't already died from the poisoned whiskey. My body remained paralyzed in fear on the couch as I watched him mow down the guests at his party one by one. I closed my eyes and remained as still as possible. He only seemed to be shooting those he didn't think were already dead. I hoped that by laying still on the couch as if I'd already died from the whiskey, he wouldn't notice me. I remained in that position for what felt like an eternity. 
listening to the dying scream of kids who I went to school with, followed by gunshots from someone who clearly had nothing to lose. I didn't open my eyes even after I heard the last gunshot. I only mustered up the courage to open them when I heard police sirens outside. The house had turned into a mass grave. All around me were people who either died from whatever poison was in the whiskey or a gunshot to the head. And lying in the middle of it all was Tim, his hand still clutching the gun that was pressed to his head. He'd done what he planned to do. He'd killed everyone who ever bullied him alongside those who only ever sat back and watched it as it happened. I guess he didn't see the need to live after that. Out of everyone who went to that party, I was the only survivor. Every time I close my eyes, I'm reminded of the sound of gunshots and my classmates screaming. Even now, I'm haunted by the thought of how close I'd come to dying that night. My parents worked as wildlife conservationists. They always encouraged me to take part in trekking clubs, summer camps, or any activity that includes nature. I learned a lot while exploring the wilderness, but this one memory still makes my entrails churn in disgust. I went to a summer camp in Sabago Lake. My parents went to Australia for a project at that time. Instead of sending me to my grandparents, they sent me to this camp so that I can learn some skills while having a good time with other kids. The camp instructor was a friend of my parents. I never knew his first name because everyone called him Mr. Bailiff. He was a strong, healthy man in his late 40s who always inspired us to take the extra step for the sake of adventure. He had a small team of senior campers who were assigned to navigate us through the day-to-day -day routine. The senior campers were boys and girls aging from 16 to 17 years. All of them were pretty familiar with the camp style which made me realize they have been with Mr. Bailiff for a long time. I, on the other hand, wasn't a newcomer either as it was my third summer camp. I have always been an active child and loved taking part in almost everything. Apart from the co-curricular, I loved taking part in the summer treasure hunt. Almost every kid waited for it eagerly. To keep the game more spontaneous, Mr. Bailiff introduced this all of a sudden technique. Whenever the air horn went on, everyone rushed outside to find a big jar filled with clues. The teams were divided and the game began. We had to search all over the campsite and sometimes even went inside the woods looking for clues. I was loving my stay there, but with time, I started to realize Mr. Bailiff is not the kind of man I thought he is. He used to get rude and insulting at times. If a kid couldn't pull off the task up to his expectations, he beat the shit out of that kid with his horrible choice of words. The anger in his eyes made him look ferocious when he scolded a kid over nothing. The senior campers never stopped him, which implies they were too scared to face him. Some seniors explained to us that Mr. Bailiff is only a strict instructor and means no harm. But what he did during our warm-up session made me feel disgusted. There was this one boy named Kurt who loved eating a lot. He was a bit overweight, but we were just kids. At that age, no one could say no to chocolate pudding. Kurt loved chocolate pudding and couldn't resist himself. After breakfast, we went to our wilderness exploration with Mr. Bailiff. He was teaching us about the different kind of plants and animals residing in our ecosystem. Everyone was listening to him with great attention when a girl screamed in fear. We all turned to her to saw her pointing at the ground behind a bush. Mr. Bailiff walked to her and everyone else followed. As we reached near the bush, we saw rotten remains of a dead possum. Flies were hovering on it and a bad stench covered the air nearby. Mr. Bailiff turned to us and said, no need to be scared, this is just a circle of life. Does anyone want to step ahead to bury this little guy? No one wanted to, but these were Mr. Bailiff's weird life lessons that we had to abide by. When no one stepped up, he chose Kurt to do this job. With an overfilled tummy and long walk in the heat, Kurt was feeling uncomfortable enough. He said in a scared voice, Um, I don't want to do this, sir. Why? Don't you know how to fig dirt? No, I do, but I don't want to go near it. It stinks. Mr. Bailiff screamed at him as usual and forced him to bury that possum's remain under the ground. Kurt dug up the first chunk of mud and I heard him gag once. No doubt he was feeling nauseous and as soon as he leaned on to move the possum using a stick, he puked on himself. The undigested pudding was all over his clothes. He started sobbing out of embarrassment, but Mr. Bailiff didn't spare him even after that. He yelled in his strict voice. 
I don't care if you vomit everywhere or even shit your pants. If you don't finish this task, I will make you eat your puke, boy. What other option did he have? He did as he was told while being drenched in his puke. The camp of enjoyment soon started to turn into the camp of torture. Mr. Bailiff was just too smart. He tortured the kids in the name of wilderness exploration and made it seem like he was teaching us how to overcome our comfort zones. Every kid in my dorm wished this nightmare to end so that they could return home. On the last week of our summer camp, we were counting days for it to end when Mr. Bailiff announced a treasure hunt. Following the rules, we got divided into teams and handed over the clues. There were artificial obstacles created for us to increase the thrill. Small hurdles such as crawling through a muddy ditch, jumping fences, climbing ropes to collect a clue was a part of it. Our team had to search for one clue inside the woods. Signboards were scattered throughout to give us hints on where the last clue can be. We were a team of four, and to win the game, we decided to split up and look for it. I was walking by a small trail when I felt someone go behind the tree nearby. I couldn't see at first, but a small hand appeared behind the tree. Uh, hello? Is it Jim? No answer came. I walked close to the tree and peeked to see who's behind it, but found no one. Running footsteps made a rustling sound on the dried leaves, and a chuckle appeared. I turned around and saw a small boy dressed as a Boy Scout. He was of my age. A weird smile took place on his face, and he said, Are you playing the treasure hunt? I nodded yes and asked, Are you from our camp? I have never seen you before. He looked up to the tree branch above his head and said, Is Mr. Bailiff around? I said in a confused voice, Yeah, he is conducting the game. I have to find the last clue or else... Parker, who are you talking to? I found Mr. Bailiff standing behind me with a pissed off face. I was going to introduce him to that boy, but he was nowhere to be found. Mr. Bailiff started scolding me for wasting time when I noticed the boy coming from the bush nearby. I pointed at him, telling Mr. Bailiff that he is the one I was talking to, and Mr. Bailiff's face turned pale. He stared at the boy with a shocking face, and for the first time, I saw him scared. He said in a fumbled voice, But you were, you were dead. The boy <laughs> chuckled and looked at the branch above his head and then back at him. Why did you force me to climb this tree? He started to walk towards Mr. Bailiff. I was stunned to see how excessively scared Mr. Bailiff was of this little boy. The more the boy walked close to him, the more Mr. Bailiff stepped back. He was sweating in fear and mumbled something. I couldn't make out what he was trying to say, but I noticed he was going to a steep edge. Mr. Bailiff was one step away from the edge when the boy stopped. He stood silently for some time, and then his head turned back at me. Just his head. I could hear the crushing of bone as his head turned to his back, and he looked at the tree once again, and then ripped off his head with his dirty little hands. Mr. Bailiff screamed one last time, and I heard a huge fall. I must have fainted too after seeing such a horrific sight. The senior campers rescued me and called the cops. Mr. Bailiff was taken to the hospital. Even though he didn't die, he broke his neck in such a terrible way that he has become paralyzed for the rest of his life. Before I could ask who that boy was, I overheard an incident that happened two years back. A boy named David came here for the summer. During one game of treasure hunt, Mr. Bailiff went a bit too rough on him and forced him to climb that tall tree irrespective of the dangers that could occur. The boy was scared and traumatized, but Mr. Bailiff went on pushing him like always. Suddenly, he slipped and fell to the ground before anyone could catch him. He broke his neck and never woke up again. His parents were told it was just an accident and no one revealed how responsible Mr. Bailiff was for that. I am happy that the poor kid got his revenge. A man like Mr. Bailiff deserves it. I am thinking there's something terribly wrong with my Minecraft account. It all started once I named one of my pigs. I have been playing this game for a few weeks and when I discovered the option to name other resources and even mobs, I decided to play this game a bit differently. I live in a small apartment. From my bedroom, one can see the bedroom of my neighbor. A 53-year-old mean lady named Miss Perron lives there. I have never seen anyone as cruel as her. She used to live with her husband, who left her for some other woman. Maybe that's what turned her to be like that, or maybe she was always like this. 
I am sure her husband left her for not being able to stay under one roof with such a psycho wife. Last week, a pretty white cat climbed up to her window and was chilling there. The cat didn't even enter her room. All of a sudden, she rushed to the window and grabbed the cat by her hands. The cat didn't get a chance to run away. She threw the cat on the ground from her two-story house. It didn't die, but its legs got hurt badly. I still see that cat limping in pain. That lady screams at every kid who comes near her house. In three words, I hate her. It was a rainy afternoon. After finishing my lunch, I was planning to play Minecraft for a bit. I turned on the PC. As the logo started to roll in, I heard that lady screaming at me. Hey, you idiot! Turn down the volume! You are interrupting my sleep! Honestly, the sound wasn't loud at all, and she had an option to close her window to avoid that. I replied to her. Close your windows, dumb woman! She started a brawl right then and there. She was repeatedly insulting and cursing me in the most abusive language possible. I fought hard, but her pitch was so annoying that I gave up and closed my windows on her face. I saw a crooked grin lighting up on her face as I backed down. I was so frustrated that I almost crushed my keyboard with my fist. Don't know why I decided to channel my anger into the game. I suddenly put a name tag on a zombie. Yeah, I named the zombie Miss Peron. I don't know why I did that and out of immense frustration, I started killing it. As soon as I hit the zombie on the head with my sword, it vanished into thin air. My anger calmed down a bit. I played for a few hours more and went to bed early that day. The next morning when I woke up, I heard an ambulance standing close to my apartment. I peeked from my window and saw paramedics taking away Miss Perron on a stretcher. She was lying there unconscious with a bleeding head. I could tell she hit her head last night and fainted inside the house. Dried blood was all over her face and clothes. Three days later, she came back home with a bandage over her head. I wanted to believe it was just an accident, but that was the first time I felt my Minecraft game was cursed. I didn't play the game for a week, and Ms. Perron didn't bother anyone like before because of her head injury. But once she started to get better, her cruel nature came back again. I knew a kid who lived down the street. His name was Noah. He was playing fetch with his dog, when he threw the ball quite higher, making it break the glass of Miss Perron's window. He was running in fear, but Miss Perron came and with his ball and told him to come and get it. I thought she might have changed finally, but as Noah walked to her expecting to get his ball back, she did a very bad thing. She grabbed Noah's ear with her bony fingers and twisted it ruthlessly. The kid cried in pain while she laughed in her evil joy. Noah ran home sobbing. I felt really bad for the poor kid, and at that time, I decided on my next move. This time, I named my pig after that crazy lady and went too far. I tied the pig to a rope and dumped it into boiling lava. A spine-chilling scream pierced the sky and people rushed to Miss Perron's house. Black smoke was coming from the house and the house caught fire. Everyone talked about how 90% of her flesh was found melted on the floor. She died that day and I am not even sorry it happened because of me. But now, this unknown power has started to take a toll on me. No matter how much I eat, my skin is rotting and I can see myself starving slowly. It's as if I am stuck in Minecraft difficulty level in real life. But the effect is coming slowly and the urge to name tag things after people I don't like is pulling me like a magnet. Last week, I was sitting near my window watching the kids playing in the streets when I overheard a conversation. They were playing in a team and there was this big boy constantly bullying others. He was taking advantage of his size and pushing others intentionally. A girl fell on hard ground and hurt her knees because of that demon. I heard two other kids yelling, Enough, Bert! You are hurting her! I couldn't stop myself anymore. That's it. His name is Bert. Now I can do what I want. I can give him what he deserves. But this time, I wanted to watch how it happened. I wanted to see if it was Minecraft making it happen or just a coincidence. I started the game on my phone and secretly kept my eyes on that kid. I named a creeper after him, Bert, and made it walk on a cactus block. Trust me, I don't know how it happened, but as soon as that creeper touched the cactus block, 
I saw Bert collapsing on the floor while itching his entire skin like a maniac. The other kids started to scream seeing him act like that. He was gagging and constantly trying to pull something off his skin. His skin was turning red and blood started to come out from everywhere. From his nose, from his eyes, from his palms, every freaking part of his body. He suffered for like five minutes and slowly gave up. I closed the window immediately once Bert took his last breath. I wonder if his parents are going insane. How come he accidentally died like that? They don't want to know what I know, and no one ever will. Yesterday, I bumped into my ex-girlfriend. I still remember how badly she insulted me in front of all my friends because I wasn't that good looking in her eyes. I just name tagged a spider by her name and smashed it with my sword. <laughs> I am hoping to get some good news soon. I don't care if this game kills me in real life, but if I am going down, I'm taking everybody with me. <laughs> yeah. I hate parties. Always have and always will. This last party I went to has cemented that fact. I was always the quiet kid in high school and not much changed when I entered college. I kept to myself most of the time, only interacting with others during group projects. I would have been completely fine with being the quiet loner for all of college life too. However, my roommate couldn't help but stick her nose in where it didn't belong. Hey Willow, wanna go to a party? My roommate asked one night, as I was reading a book on my bed. The nearby frat's throwing a party tonight. I looked at her with a deadpan gaze. Do you really need an answer to that question? My roommate rolled her eyes. Yeah, I figured that was coming. Still, it wouldn't hurt to give it a try. No thanks. I'm good. You have fun though. Uh-huh. She paused for a moment before speaking again. Did I mention that they have free food? We got into my roommate's car and arrived at the frat in under an hour. Hey, free food is free food, right? A broke-ass college girl like me wasn't going to pass on an easy meal that wasn't cup ramen like that. The bouncer didn't even bother asking our names when he saw that we were girls and let us in right away. The party was already underway inside. People, mostly girls missing a few crucial articles of clothing, were getting wasted on whatever the hell was in those red paper cups. My roommate went to get two full cups and handed one to me. Thanks, I said as I looked at its contents. To my surprise, it wasn't the piss yellow beer I'd thought it'd be. Is... is this red wine they're serving? Sure is, said my roommate. House Delta Psi Omega is classy like that. Immediately after saying that, she went to chug god knows how much of said wine through a hose while upside down. Where the hell the frat got their hands on a wooden wine keg, I still have no idea. I took one sip of the wine and my face scrunched up in disgust. It was wine all right, and I hated wine, and all alcohol for that matter. I ditched the cup of wine on a table when no one was looking, and went straight to the snacks table. I may not like frats all that much, but I gotta hand it to them. They knew how to choose their party snacks. Within the hour, I became the only sober person left in that frat house. A pink, drunken blush pervaded everyone else's faces. For a moment, I thought the party might not be so bad after all. At the very least, I'd get to see a bunch of frat boys and sorority girls making fools out of themselves. But then came the guy in a robe. I almost didn't notice him at first in the chaos of the party. He descended from the stairs of the frat house, his long purple robe dragging behind him down the steps as he descended, and he was wearing what looked like a ring of grapevine around his head like a crown. While everyone else was drinking from red paper cups, he had an honest-to-god goblet brimming with wine in his hand. The weird guy raised the goblet in the air. To Greek life, he shouted. To Greek life, echoed everyone else at the party, even those not part of the frat. And to Dionysus, the robed man continued. And to Dionysus, 
My eyebrow raised at the name. I recognized it from one of my ancient mythology courses. If I remembered correctly, Dionysus was supposed to be the Greek god of wine. A little odd, but I brushed it off. I guess the frat must have taken the whole Greek life thing pretty seriously. Someone started playing music and without any prompting, the people in the party started to dance. I kept to myself in a corner of the room while everyone else flailed their limbs around like in a drunken bliss. The dance went on for hours, or at least felt like hours to me. The disorganized dancing formed into a cohesive ring of people dancing next to each other, hand in hand, without a care in the world. The dance all surrounded one person, the guy in the purple robe, who looked on approvingly. The more I looked on, the more uncomfortable I started to feel. I always knew frats were kind of like cults, but this was getting way too obvious. I wanted to leave, but didn't want to risk pushing through the drunk dancers and breaking the ring they'd formed. Something about the looks of crazed ecstasy in their eyes told me that they wouldn't take too kindly to being interrupted. I was literally saved by the bell when someone rang the doorbell. Pizza delivery! yelled the pizza guy from the other side of the door. Every head in the room turned towards the door. The stuporous joy on their faces warped into an insane rage. A horde of college girls stormed to the door, opened it, and dragged the hapless delivery boy inside. In a hundred other scenarios, this would have been a dream come true for any guy. Not this time, though. They pinned him onto the ground as he squirmed under them in a futile struggle. He yelled at them to let him go, but nobody was listening. Everyone's eyes were fixed on the man in the purple robe. Sparagmos! He shouted. Sparagmos! 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 Repeated the drunk college students over and over again. I watched in horror as they tore the delivery boy apart. They tore him limb from limb, starting with his arms and legs, before the robed man ripped off his head whilst the partygoers held back his torso. The poor bastard screamed all the way, right up until his head was separated from his body. I escaped the party through a back window in all the confusion and called the police. When they got there, the drunk partygoers were feasting on the dismembered body of the murdered delivery boy. The robed man sat above them all on the top of the stairs, tearing off and eating strips of flesh from the delivery head. Needless to say, I'm never going to another frat party again. I decided to throw a massive house party in my senior year of high school. My parents were both on a business trip, so me and my older brother had the house to ourselves. I only invited a few of my close friends over, while my brother decided to invite everyone he shared a room with and all of their friends as well. Yeah, he was always the more social of the two of us. I didn't mind it all that much. It saved me from the trouble of looking for more people and gave me the opportunity to meet some new people. If I was lucky, I thought I'd be able to chat up a new girl too. On the night of the party, my brother, who was 21, bought enough booze from a nearby liquor store to make a circus of elephants drunk. Meanwhile, I prepared bowls of junk food like cheesy nachos and greasy chicken fries for the guest and moved the furniture around to give space for dancing. The first person to arrive was one of my friends, whom I hired as a DJ on short notice. I helped him set up his equipment and pick the music just in time before the guests started to arrive. People drank and danced and played beer pong on the dining room table. I chatted up several girls at the party, though most of them seemed more interested in just having a good time than talking to me. That is, until I met this one girl who was hanging, sipping beer by herself in a corner, looking lonelier than she should have. She was a short brunette wearing jeans and a casual t-shirt, who I thought I recognized from school, but wasn't sure. Seeing no harm in trying, I walked up to her and started a conversation. Hey, how are you enjoying the party so far? The girl looked up from her cup of beer and smiled. Yeah, I'm having fun, she said, though the soft tone of her voice didn't sound very convincing. The nachos are great. Upon hearing that, I jumped at the chance to extend the conversation. Glad to hear that. You know, I made them myself. I don't remember what she said next, but one thing led to another and soon we were both in deep conversation. 
She was quiet and shy at first, but gradually opened up after a few more cups of beer and God knows how many snacks. I learned that her name was Liz and that she was one of the cheerleaders from the school's football team. She was at the party alone because she'd just broken up with her boyfriend, some jock from the football team, who was way too possessive of her when they dated. She was hoping to meet someone new at the party, and apparently, I ticked all the right boxes with her. About halfway through the party, we were sitting side by side on the couch, making out. I thought I might just get lucky that night after all. I probably would have asked her to come upstairs with me had we not been interrupted. In the middle of us exploring each other's mouths, I felt a firm hand grab me by the shoulder. I was yanked away from Liz and came face to face with a blonde jock who had like a hundred pounds of muscles over me. What are you doing with my girlfriend? He screamed. I immediately realized who he was and what Liz said next confirmed it. God damn it, Joe. We're not dating anymore. The ex-boyfriend turned his eyes to Liz. You don't get to decide that. Hey man, back off, I said. Though coming from me, I probably sounded as threatening as a house cat hissing at a lion. You aren't together anymore. She can do what she wants. I saw a vein bulge on Joe's forehead before he raised and drew his fist back for a punch. I tensed my face in anticipation of impact, but none ever came. What do you think you're doing with my brother? Rang my brother's voice from throughout the house. Our eyes turned to look at my brother power walking through the horde of guests who parted away from him. Suddenly, Everyone was looking at my brother staring down at Joe, who still held me by the shoulder with a sweaty grip. Let him go, my brother said in a low, threatening voice, and get the fuck out of my house. There was a moment of silence. Joe was a big guy, but my brother was even taller. Once he realized that my brother wasn't in the mood to deal with his bullshit, he let me go and walked out the door without another word. People cheered my brother for throwing out that asshole, and everyone in the party continued drinking and dancing as if nothing happened. Upon seeing Liz, my brother gave me a sly wink and went off to catch his own fish. While I wasn't able to intimidate Joe in the slightest, it seemed like me just standing up to him was enough to impress Liz. I won't go into detail, but about half an hour later, we were both in my room alone, having a different kind of good time. The little debacle with Joe aside, Everything was shaping up to be a perfect night. That was, until I heard a loud bang come from downstairs. At first, I thought someone must have dropped something like a bowl of food or beer keg. Then another bang came that caused the dance music to come to a sudden halt and be replaced by a girl screaming. What's going on? Liz asked with fear in her eyes. I don't know. Stay here. I'll go check. I ran from my bedroom and rushed down the stairs. I nearly puked from what I saw. Everyone at the party was either crouched down or hiding under a piece of furniture. Meanwhile, the friend who I hired to be the DJ was lying on the ground with almost half his head missing. Shards of white skull dotted the wooden floor alongside pink splattered brain matter. One of his eyes had been blown clean off his head and stared lifeless at me as I tried to process the situation. Tom, get down! My brother's voice snapped me out of my terrified trance. I turned to look at my brother just in time to hear another loud bang and see his heart explode from his chest in multiple bloody chunks. I was horrified at what I saw, but I followed his dying words, laid flat on the ground with my hands clasped above my head. The loud bangs, which I now know to be gunshots, continued to ring out over the next hours. Every time it did, something or someone inside my house would be destroyed. One of the bullets ricocheted off the wall and grazed me in the shoulder, but I kept myself from yelping to not give away my position. I stayed there for what felt like forever before the cops arrived. I couldn't see what happened, but I could hear the gunfight outside as the shooter fought back against the police with what little ammo he had left for the next 10 minutes. In the end, I heard the loud blast of a shotgun followed by a loud thud. Police flooded the house soon after to treat the injured. I was treated for the graze in my shoulder and lifted out in a gurney. As they carried me to the ambulance, I caught a passing glance of the shooter's body lying motionless on the ground. It was Joe. His hand still gripped the hunting rifle he used to shoot at us in his cold, dead hands. A shotgun blast had torn through his midsection and sprayed his mangled organs all over my front lawn. I hoped it hurt when the police shot him. I was able to make a full recovery from my injury, but the trauma of that night still remained. I lost my brother forever, and all because of some asshole who couldn't handle his girlfriend dumping him. I'll never forget or forgive Joe for what he did. 
If hell exists, I hope he burns in it forever. Sometimes in life, you do a silly prank that turns out to be doomsday for someone else. Well, that's exactly what happened to me when I was a kid. I grew up in a huge house by the beach with my little sister Amy. She was a year younger than me. Being the youngest and the pretty little princess of our family, everyone loved her like crazy. My mom always gave me a lecture on how I need to be the big brother and take care of her all the time. All that overflown love spoiled my sister to such an extent that she became stubborn and nagging whenever things didn't go her way. In front of my parents and family, she would behave like she is the angel on the earth. But in reality, she was different in the wrong way. She never apologized after making a mistake, and no matter how many times she got punished, she always found her way around it. I guess it was partially my mother's fault for being too easy on her. I still remember the day the principal called dad saying there has been an accident in school. I was with my grandparents, but when I came home, I heard a girl named Sally was found dead in the girl's bathroom. No one knows what exactly happened to her, but it seemed like she slipped somehow and smashed her face on the glass mirror, leading to the broken glass cutting her eyeballs in half. She bled to death. Yeah, it was a pretty violent sight. When the cops inquired everyone about this incident, the school janitor said he saw Amy coming out of the washroom right before Sally's body was discovered. But she was just a little girl. Who would suspect her, right? But I knew. I knew what she was. With more days passing, I started to become scared of her. Yeah, scared of my little sister. Funny, huh? But when you wake up in the middle of the night finding your weird sister standing near your bed, looking at her with her shiny green eyes and expressionless face, you can't laugh it off. Why did she do that? I don't know, and I never dared to ask. Whoever didn't agree with her or said no faced a consequence labeled under the tag of an accident. She loved stomping on any insect, even if it's miles away from her. She grabbed butterflies with her soft red fingers and tore their wings apart with joy. Whenever birds hurt their wings and landed in our backyard, instead of aiding them like every normal kid, Amy fed the already suffering bird to our neighbor's ferocious dog. She chuckled in excitement as the dog shredded the flapping bird into bits and pieces. My parents never paid attention to her cruel nature, even if I told them repeatedly. But one day, things took a dangerous turn. We used to go to the beach almost every weekend. I loved walking by the shore, submerging my feet into the salty waves. At some distance from the shore, there were rusty old caves. The area was secluded, as very few people went there. Whenever I needed a place to escape, I used to go there. I pretended like the caves were my kingdom, and I was the king of an invisible ray. I kept lots of my toys there and everything I could collect from the beach. I never told Amy about this place, but nothing can be hidden from her vulture eyes. One weekend, we went to the beach and my parents put up a small picnic near the shore. Amy got busy building her sandcastles and then demolishing them with one kick. I think she felt more joy in destroying them than building them. I secretly snuck out from there and went to my territory. I put up a wooden plank on the entrance of a small cave like a door to my castle. I slowly shifted the plank and got inside. I was just about to close it when I heard a chuckle behind me. Out of fear and shock, I turned around and found Amy sitting inside the cave already. You think you can hide from me? She said in her cold, squeaky voice. I wasn't hiding from you. I just came here to be with myself. I replied and sat down on the ground. You hate me, right? Secretly, you wish I was never born, right? What? I don't wish that. Oh, but I do. I wish I was the only child and mommy and daddy never had you. I would have gotten all their attention. You anyway get that. Don't worry, once I grow up, I'll move far away from you all. Ha ha ha, you're such a dork. Come on, let's go. Amy got up and started to walk out of the cave. Where, where are you going? I asked impatiently. I saw a big cave at the back. Don't you want to explore that? Her eyes sparkled as she said this. But we can lose our way. 
Besides, what if there's something inside those caves? Like, like what? A tiger? Don't be an idiot. Let's go. Also, I want to try this out. So far, I didn't notice her hands. But as I did, I saw she was holding Dad's metal detector. I know Dad keeps his things in his study, and we're not supposed to touch them. I said in a tense voice, Why did you bring that? You know we shouldn't be playing with Dad's equipment. Oh, come on. He wouldn't know unless you tell him. And you won't tell him. I knew she was not going to back off. We came out and started walking to the big cave behind the bushes. The summer wind created a rustling sound in the coconut trees. The big old cave stood like an epitome of mystery. Moss and fungus were growing all over its wall. Amy stopped right in front of the cave and stared at the dark, hollow entrance ahead. Why are we even here? I asked fearfully. We are going to look for treasure. Don't you remember the story Mom told us last night? Caves like this are filled with treasures. Now let's go for our treasure hunt. Amy handed me a small flashlight and told me to show the way. I realized how mean and selfish she is. If anything bad came at us, she wanted me to face it. My own sister was using me as her shield just to have some fun in a stupid treasure hunt. But she was very greedy. If Amy found something attractive, my parents had to buy it for her, and if they didn't, she didn't hesitate to steal it at all. Mom's story triggered her to think she was going to find a hidden treasure inside this cave. That's why she brought Dad's metal detector. But I was sure. I knew she would go home empty-handed. I was walking with a flashlight while she strolled with her metal detector behind me. The continuous beeping of the detector echoed in the cave. Accidentally, I flashed a light on the ceiling and an army of ugly, stinky bats flew over us, scaring the hell out of me. Ah! You silly! Don't flash your light on them, idiot! Amy didn't respect me at all. Maybe it was her cruel nature that made her immune to all kinds of jump scares. She snatched the flashlight from my hand and took the lead. Without saying a single word, I followed her. Even though she was not the perfect sister, I couldn't ditch her inside a dark cave. After walking for a minute or so, the metal detector started to make a rapid sound, denoting it had found something. Amy crouched down and started to dig the wet, muddy ground with her beach shovel. Within five seconds, she screamed in joy. Look what I found! She lifted her hand, and in the flashlight, I saw a sparkling bracelet. Her face lit up even more greed. The bracelet was shining like the stars in the night sky. I didn't at all expect something like this to be found here. Amy picked up the detector and started walking ahead. I stopped her saying, Well, you got your treasure. Let's go now. It's getting dark and mom will be worried. No way. We have just started. If you want to go, you can go. Fine. I am done here. I turned back while Amy went in with the detector and flashlight. The beeping sound faded away with her footsteps. I was about to come out when I heard my sister's spine-chilling scream. I ran inside, irrespective of the darkness. I could barely see ahead when I heard a collapse of boulders. At the end of the cave, I found Amy's flashlight. The glass got broken, but was still on. A beeping sound was going crazy in the dark, and there was another sound in that empty cave. The sound of a little girl choking. I flashed the light following the sound, and I couldn't blink anymore. Amy was lying on the ground, smashed under big rocks falling from the roof of the cave. Her partial face had no features. Flesh and blood were all over the place. But with the half remaining face, she was staring at me. She was looking at me with one eye and trying to tell me something, but the excessive blood choked her. She coughed blood. Her body trembled like those wounded birds when the neighbor's dog ate them alive. I will never be able to get that sight out of my mind. My parents rescued me with the help of the cops. After searching for us for almost an hour, they finally came to look at these caves and found me standing like a statue near my dead sister. It was all an accident. No one had any doubt of that. My mom never spoke a word after that. Cops said the cave's roof somehow collapsed and it was nothing but an unfortunate event. I won't say that I don't miss her, but we learned to move on. I accepted her fate and grieved for her terrible death for years. But yesterday, my mom passed away in her sleep, and her attorney handed me a letter that she left for me. The letter read, My dear Jim, we all loved Amy in our own ways. I know you resent me for not raising her with more discipline and good habits. 
I agree, I was weak, but then I finally realized. The day Sally died, I knew what a monster I had created. I had to put an end to this. The cave's roof didn't collapse on its own. I was the one who buried the bracelet inside and told Amy the made-up story about treasure just to make her go there looking for it. I sacrificed my own child so that she can't hurt anyone else. It was better that she got the punishment from me rather than rotting in a cell for the rest of her life. I hope you forgive me for taking your sister away too soon. I am glad that at least one of my children grew up to be a human being. Love, Mom. I was 10 and my sister was six or seven years old when this incident happened. We lived in a small suburb with less entertainment. The only thing we looked forward to was the weekends. Because on weekends, our mom took us to the city park and then for a small shopping trip where we could get any toy or chocolate we wanted. There was a Target store across the city park where we used to go. Being a huge Target store, it was our ideal spot to play all kinds of games. I still remember running among the high-rise shelves trying to catch each other. But being kids, we were naive. We had no idea that not everyone saw us like cute little children. Some saw us like prey too. After a hectic week at work, when mom got some leisure, the weekend came knocking around the door. I could tell she was too tired and needed rest. But my sister Martha was adamant to go to the Target store and buy her long-wished Barbie doll. Mom tucked us to bed saying the next day she will take us there. Next morning when I woke up, I found mom lying sick on her bed. She caught the flu and instructed me not to go near her. I don't think I can take you out today. Let me call grandma. She can take you to the park. There's some money on the kitchen counter. Take it and have fun today. I nodded my head and mom called grandma explaining the entire situation. Mom told us to listen to her and not wander around by ourselves. Being the big brother, she set me in charge to take care of Martha. Within a half hour, Grandma pulled her car into our driveway and honked the horn. Bye, kids. Have fun. Listen to Grandma. Mom bid us goodbye, and we ran outside. I sat on the passenger seat, and Martha sat at the back. Grandma told us funny stories on our way to the park, and we began the day with cheerful laughter. When we reached the park, we saw other kids running here and there. The park was an ideal spot for family picnics, so lots of people used to come there. Martha ran to the swing, and I followed her. After playing for almost two hours, I felt like getting a soda for myself. The Target store stood across the park. I walked to Grandma, who was sitting on the corner park bench and reading her book. Grandma, can we go to the store? Sure, but just wait some minutes. One of my friends is about to come. We'll go after meeting her. I had no problem waiting, but Martha was going crazy to buy her Barbie doll. She pulled my shirt and said, The store is right there. We can go and get it by ourselves. Grandma looked at me and nodded her head, saying, No, no. You two wait here. My friend will be here any minute. But my sister has always been a stubborn kid. She started kicking the mud and pleaded to Grandma to let us go. Being fed up with her tantrums, Grandma asked me if I could take her there and wait in the store. I replied I could. Martha and I started walking towards Target. Being a huge store, I often enjoyed exploring that place. Not to mention, the toy section was our favorite, but I liked roaming around the entire store. As we entered the store, we realized it was indeed a weekend because people were all over the place buying groceries, food items, daily needs, and whatsoever. I held Martha's hand because I didn't want her to get lost amidst the crowd. We started walking towards the toys section and Martha's face lit up in joy. She was ranting about how she is going to dress her Barbie once she takes her home. The toy section was comparatively empty considering the other departments. As soon as she saw Barbie dolls stacked up on the shelves, she let go of my hand and rushed towards them. Don't run, Martha, I screamed. Look, there's so many of them. I will buy one on each birthday, then I will have a room full of Barbies. Her eyes dazzled in excitement. I took out one Barbie randomly and said, Yeah, yeah, now let's go buy this one. I will get a soda after that. I don't want that one. I put the Barbie back and asked in a tiring voice, Then which one do you want? They're all the same, you know. No, they're not. She then pointed her fingers to a Barbie dressed in blue at a really top shelf, which was obviously out of my reach. I tried to grab that jumping two or three times, but they all failed. Just when I was thinking of looking for a Target employee to help us out, 
A woman with a squeaky voice spoke to us. Do you need help with that? I followed the voice and saw a woman standing in front of us. For a woman, her physique was really well built. She had broad shoulders and too much makeup on her face. The red lipstick on her rough lips looked like dried blood stains. She smiled with her yellow teeth and asked again, Do you need help with that? Before I could say anything, Martha pointed to the top shelf saying, Can you get that blue, Barbie? She slowly came close to us and without taking her eyes off me, grabbed the Barbie. Here you go, little girl. Doesn't your brother talk much? Thanks for helping us. I see you talk really well. What is your name? Matthew, and that's my sister Martha. How sweet. You know what, Martha? I have so many beautiful dolls in my van. Would you like to come and take a look? You can get the ones you like for free. Maybe I was only 10 years old, but I knew this woman is a stranger to us, and honestly, I wasn't liking her at all. No thanks. We better get going. Our grandma will be here any minute. As soon as she heard me mentioning my grandma, her face changed. Oh, I thought you guys were all by yourselves. I started to walk away pulling Martha, but being the hyperactive kid, she replied, Yeah, we are. Grandma is waiting for us in the park. I saw the woman's eyes sparkle with a weird joy. She once again gave her dirty yellow smile and said, Oh, I see. I'll see you around then. I walked away holding my sister's hand without taking the conversation ahead. I looked back just to see if she is following us and found her standing in the same manner, smiling at us. We reached near the cash counter and stood in line waiting for our turn. There were four other people ahead of us and I remembered I forgot to buy my soda. I told Martha to wait in line and rushed to get my soda can. Making my way among the crowd and cackle of people, when I finally got my soda, I realized Martha might be waiting there all by herself. I was walking fast to the cash counter when a hand grabbed my shoulder. I turned around and saw Grandma. Where's your sister? She asked. I told her she is waiting for me near the cash counter. We both went there, but Martha wasn't there. Grandma and I both started to panic and informed the woman at the counter about my sister's sudden disappearance. They started announcing all over the store, asking for Martha to meet us back here, but she was nowhere to be found. We searched the entire store with four employees and I was terrified that something bad might have happened to her. The store manager called the cops, and that's when I remembered about that weird-looking woman. I told the cops how she was trying to take her to her minivan, saying she had lots of dolls inside it. The police rushed to the Target parking lot and covered it from all sides. Thankfully, they found this damp, rusty black minivan parked at the dark corner. The van was shaking violently, and a cry of a kid was coming from it. My grandma held me back so I couldn't see what those cops saw once they opened the back door of the minivan. Years later, when I grew up, my mother told me all about it. The woman was actually a man dressed like a woman. The cops caught him while he was tying up my sister with barbed wire. Not just that, there were two other small girls inside that van. They were heavily sedated, and there's no doubt he abducted those two kids too. But once they checked the front seat, they met with an even uglier sight. There was a woman lying on that seat with her face cut off with a sharp knife. Her hair was pulled out and formed into a wig. Her mutilated face was lying on the dashboard of the car with heavy makeup put on it. So basically, when we met that man, he was wearing this dead woman's face, which is why he looked so weird to me. The man was arrested with the charge of kidnapping, abduction, and murder. This woman was his wife who used to help him by luring kids into his van, but with time, she demanded to be free of this inhumane profession and might have threatened the man to stop or she would go to the cops. What creeps me to the core is that this man not just killed his wife to shut her mouth, he even decided to use her face to appear like a woman in front of kids. And trust me, his plan did work to some extent. When I went to get a soda, he approached my sister again and lured her into his trap. If you ask me, I don't think that man did all these gruesome acts just for money. He is a sick psycho and I'm glad he is going to rot in prison for the rest of his life. I was driving down a long stretch of road to visit my family when I came across a hitchhiker. I usually don't pick up hitchhikers since I didn't trust people in general, but something about this girl made me want to help her. Maybe it was because she reminded me of my sister, 
but the little angel on my shoulder egged me to offer some help as I drove closer and closer towards her. She was on the younger side, early 20s at the very most. The dress she wore was nowhere near appropriate for the cold weather. In fact, it looked like more of a nightgown you'd wear to bed, not something you'd wear to a desert at night. There was no way she wasn't freezing in the cold air, yet she just kept trudging forward with her eyes fixed on the ground, as if in a trance. I slowed down my car to a halt next to her. I rolled down my window and she turned to look at me with a weary expression on her face. Hey, miss, would you like a lift? I asked. She seemed hesitant at first, shifting her eyes to the road behind me as if hoping another car would come by. I didn't blame her for it. Any woman would be hesitant to get into the car of a man they've never seen before in the middle of the night. In the end, it seemed the risk of dying from hypothermia outweighed the risk of getting into a stranger's car. A lift would be nice, she finally said after a lengthy pause. I don't mind giving you a ride, I told her with a smile. But do you mind telling me where you're headed first? I... I don't know, she said whilst averting her eyes from mine. Looking her over again up close, I noticed that she had cuts and bruises all over her exposed arms and legs. Many of them still looked fresh. I couldn't tell if they were the result of an accident outdoors or something much worse. Whatever the case, there was no way I could just let her go after seeing those injuries. Well, I'm headed to a town a few miles away from here, I told her. You want me to drop you off there? They have a clinic that'll fix you up. You could probably catch a bus ride there too if you're lost. The girl looked up and we made eye contact for the first time. Her shoulders relaxed slightly. I could almost see the hint of a smile on her face. That sounds great. Thank you. The girl got into the shotgun seat of my car and I continued driving down the road. I tried to make conversation with her but she wasn't much of a talker. Anytime I asked her a casual question, she gave me a short, almost robotic answer. What's your name? Laura. The moon's pretty tonight, isn't it? Yeah, I guess it is. So, what do you do for a living? I'm unemployed. She fidgeted in her seat the entire ride, too. Every now and then, I'd catch her glancing at the rearview mirrors as if she was scared of being followed, despite us being in the middle of the desert. I had just about given up trying to talk to her when I heard a loud growl come from somewhere in the car. I was startled at first, but then I saw Laura holding a hand over her belly with an embarrassed frown on her face. After realizing that it was just her stomach growling, I held back a chuckle and told her to help herself to one of the granola bars I kept in the glove compartment. Are you sure? She asked. Yeah, go on ahead, I told her. I got plenty of them anyway. I tend to get hungry on long trips, so I make sure to stock up on them. Oh, I see. She opened the glove compartment and took out a granola bar. She demolished the whole thing in less than a minute. Hey, you can have a few more if you'd like, I said, after seeing how hungry she was. Actually, I think we're coming to a pit stop soon, too. You want to grab something to eat? I don't have any money, though. She told me in a dejected tone. No worries, it's my treat. I told her with the friendliest smile I could muster. I'm kind of peckish myself anyway. Well, if it's alright with you, I would really appreciate that. Laura became much more cheerful after that. She even started smiling and chuckling (laughs) at jokes I made. I still didn't get to learn much about her though. We talked about family specifically mine, since from what I gathered, she didn't really like to talk about hers. By the time we reached the pit stop, we were talking casually like we were actual friends. She seemed cold outside without my car heater keeping her warm, so I took off my jacket and gave it to her. I had a sweater under it anyway, so it didn't bother me much. She zipped up the jacket and pulled the hood over her head before we walked into the pit stop diner. We walked past several truckers who were laughing and joking with each other over a mountain of food. Laura seemed like someone who liked her peace and quiet, so I led her to the furthest corner of the diner to avoid the noise. 
It didn't help much, but I think Laura appreciated the gesture. I ordered two stacks of pancakes, a generous amount of bacon, and enough coffee to wake both of us up for the long ride ahead. We'd planned on just having a quick bite to eat before going back on the road, but ended up talking for several hours. I traveled a lot while she was sheltered all her life, so she took a keen interest in my travel stories. Before we knew it, we lost track of time and had drunk enough coffee to keep us awake for weeks. I almost didn't notice the diner entrance bell ring behind me as yet another customer stepped inside the pit stop. The other hand immediately pulled down the hood of the jacket I gave her and shrunk into the seat when she saw who entered. I could tell from what little of her face that wasn't hidden by the hood that she must have been scared. I looked behind me to see who'd entered. Standing in front of the entrance was a disheveled-looking man with short, unkempt hair and a crazed look in his bloodshot eyes. He walked up to the nearest person, one of the truckers, and tapped him on the shoulder. "'Hey, have you seen a girl with brown hair come by here?' he asked. The trucker looked him up and down before letting out a hearty chuckle. (laughs) "'No, man, I haven't, but you sure as hell won't be getting any girls looking like that.' His trucker friends joined in the laughter. The man was less amused. He grabbed the trucker by his shirt and pulled something out from under his shirt. I stifled a gasp when I recognized that it was a gun. He pressed the parallel of the gun to the trucker's head. You took her, didn't you? He screamed. I knew my Laura couldn't get this far on her own. Where is she? As the other truckers attempted to talk the crazed man down, Laura covered her face, her tears seeping out between her fingers. That's my dad, she whispered under her breath. I realized right then and there where the cuts and bruises on her must have come from. I wanted to help her get out, but the only way out was past her gun-toting father. So instead, I just kept quiet, hoping that he wouldn't notice us while the truckers and staff attempted to de-escalate the situation. It didn't work. The crazed father shot the trucker in the head. The bullet tore through his skull and sent his liquefied brains flying onto the walls. Spurred by the death of his friend, another trucker grabbed the man by the wrist. The gun fired off a few times during the struggle, but they managed to force him to drop the gun. A waitress quickly kicked away the gun, and the trucker started beating the man, bringing down their fists on his face and body over and over again. By the time the police arrived, the man was barely recognizable anymore. His face was swollen and blue. Both his eyes had completely ruptured with blood trickling from the corners. His yellow teeth lay scattered on the floor, and the ones still in his mouth were barely hanging on. I approached the police officer who came to arrest the man with Laura, and we explained the situation to him. Laura had run away from home to get away from her mentally unstable father's abuse. He followed her down the only road near their isolated home, the one I was driving on where I found her. He's now in prison and will be for a long time. Meanwhile, Laura is finally free to live her own life after being trapped with him for so long. I still keep in touch with Laura. Although she hasn't completely recovered from her trauma, her future is brighter now that her father isn't in it. My parents were overprotective of me when I was young. I couldn't really blame them though. For as long as I could remember, I've had only one eye and a good portion of my left face was covered in burn marks. According to my parents, I got them when I was still just a baby during a house fire in a different town. I can't remember any of it myself. I guessed that my near-death experience as a baby must have made my parents overprotective of me. They never let me go outside on my own, and when I did go outside under their supervision, they would always make me cover my burnt face under a hood or a hat. I wasn't even allowed to go to school since they were afraid I'd get picked on by the other kids for my appearance. Because of that, my mother had homeschooled me since I was old enough to speak. For a long time, I did everything they told me to like the obedient daughter they wanted me to be. But like most kids, I got more and more rebellious as I got older. When I was about 12, I started sneaking out of my house when my parents were at work or asleep. Not to smoke or drink or anything. For the most part, 
All I did was take walks in the park to take in the fresh air. Since my dad worked the night shift and my mom liked to sleep early, the only times I could sneak out were during night and late evening. I didn't mind though. I was happy for a chance to get out of the house without my parents watching my every move. Back then, I was blissfully still unaware that there were terrible people in the world who wouldn't hesitate to take advantage of even a little girl. As you can imagine, some people in town started gossiping about a little girl with a scarred face walking around a mostly empty park in the middle of the night. I'm pretty sure I became an urban legend amongst the kids and teenagers too. Looking back, that must have played a factor in what would later happen. It all started during one of my nightly walks. I was strolling through the local park with the blue hood of my jacket pulled over my face like I had a hundred times before. The flickering lights of the neglected street lamps meant to illuminate the trail gave me just enough light for me to see ahead with my one eye, though I still had to be careful not to bump into anything. I strolled through the darkness with only the crickets and the caddy dids to keep me company. Listening to their shrill cries resonating through the cold night air gave me a sense of freedom that I could never get cooped up in my parents' house. It almost distracted me enough to not notice that I was followed. Having lived most of my life with only one eye, my sense of hearing had to compensate for it by being sharper than most. From the sea of nocturnal noises around me, I was able to pick out what sounded like footsteps on the cobblestone behind me. The sounds seemed to be trying to mask itself by matching my own footsteps, and it was doing a pretty damn good job at it too. Every time I took a step forward, I heard the sound echo ever so faintly behind me. I doubt anyone without an unusually sharp sense of hearing like mine would have heard it. I decided to test my suspicion by stopping halfway through a step to throw my follower out of sync with me. I froze right before my foot could touch the ground and make a noise. The moment I did, I heard a single footstep ring out behind me. Although it was barely audible amongst the ambient noises, to me, it might as well have been a deafening danger siren. My heartbeat skyrocketed and I broke into a sudden sprint, not even bothering to look back. I was somewhat relieved when I didn't hear anyone running after me from behind. Still, I ran like a bat out of hell back home just in case. When I got home, I snuck back inside through my bedroom window and locked both it and my bedroom door. Once I'd calmed down enough, I tried to convince myself that the person following me was just someone curious about the urban legend of the ghost girl with a burnt face and not something much worse. That night, I stayed up watching the window until I saw my father's car pull into the house. Seeing his car set my mind at ease. Even if the person from the park followed me home, I knew that my father would keep me safe as long as he was around. I was homeschooled by my mom the next day while my dad watched the TV. It was a lesson in mathematics or something equally boring. I struggled to stay up, especially after having little to no sleep the night before. My mother was quick to notice and asked if I was all right. I'm fine. I told her while I was also stifling a yawn. You don't look fine to me. She closed the math textbook and patted me on the back. Go get some rest, sweetie. I'll fix you something to eat. Thanks, mom, I said with a smile. I trudged up to my bedroom and got ready for a midday nap. But before I let my head hit the pillow, I went to my window to close the curtains. When I did, I saw something that sent chills down my spine. A man was standing half hidden behind the fence. He looked like a normal guy in his 30s wearing clean but drabbly colored clothes. However, the fact that he was staring straight at me was enough to make me sweat. I closed the curtains and huddled up in my bed hoping that he'll go away soon. I heard the sound of a doorbell come from downstairs only seconds later. I peeked through the curtains despite myself. I saw the man who'd been watching me waiting right at the front door. The door opened and my father stepped outside to talk to him. I couldn't tell what they were talking about, but the longer the conversation got, the more and more angry my father seemed. Without any warning, my father punched the man in the face. The man fell on the ground and my father kept pummeling him again and again until his face was a black and blue mess dripping with blood. Though he might have been my stalker, I couldn't bear to see someone get beaten so badly. I closed the curtains and curled up on my bed with tears in my eyes. Moments later, I heard my father knock on my bedroom door. Sweetie, we have to go now, he told me with panic in his voice. I didn't think to question him and quickly followed him out of the house and into the car 
past my unconscious stalker lying on the porch. My mother joined us in the car and soon we were speeding out of the neighborhood. I wanted to ask where we were going, but the distress on my parents' faces told me that they probably didn't know either. Not long after we left, I noticed the car following us from the back seat window. I'd never seen the car before, but I could see the bruised face of my stalker behind the wheel. His left eye was swollen shut and blood trickled from his nose and the corners of his lips. My eyes were fixed on him when the car came to a sudden stop. I turned around to see what made us stop. Relief washed over me when I saw a barricade of police cars in front of us. But when I looked at my parents, their faces did not share my relief. Instead, they seemed frightened and on the verge of panic. Before I could ask what was wrong, they both jumped out of the car and ran only to be apprehended and cuffed by the police officers. Everything was a blur after that. My parents and I were taken to the station in police cars. My supposed stalker was taken there as well. But unlike my parents, he wasn't being cuffed. Once we were at the station, I finally got an answer to what the hell was going on and why on earth my stalker wasn't arrested while my parents were. A sympathetic police officer explained everything to me while I listened to him in silent shock. Twelve years ago, an unsolved case of arson caused a house fire that claimed the lives of a young family. The charred bodies of the parents were found in the smoldering wreckage, but their infant daughter was nowhere to be found. That infant daughter was me. My real parents had died in the same house fire that took my left eye and burnt my face. The people who I thought were my parents were actually my kidnappers. Kidnappers who had gotten away with their crimes for over a decade. Police suspected that they might have been the arsonists who started the fire that claimed my real parents' lives in the first place, all because they wanted a child of their own but couldn't have one due to medical reasons. My stalker was actually a private investigator, hired by my real uncle to find me when everyone else thought I died in the fire. I now live with my uncle. He is a kind man and he does his best to care for me by himself. However, I can't help but wonder if my life would have been better had I never learned the truth about my family. I was forced to hitchhike in the desert when my car broke down. I was going to visit my family across the state when the cheap secondhand Toyota I got for my birthday broke down. While I didn't like the idea of getting into a stranger's car for hours on end, hoping that they wouldn't try anything, I wasn't left with much of a choice. Hell, I wasn't even sure if I'd be able to find a ride. The sun was already down when my car broke down. Cars were less likely to stop for hitchhikers after dark, and it was risky to trust anyone who did stop to give you a ride, especially if you're a woman like me. I learned that all too well that night. A trailer truck was cruising down the highway, and I stuck out a thumb to tell them I was looking for a ride. The truck slowed to a stop, and the driver's side window rolled down. Inside the truck was a slightly overweight man dressed in a dirty red flannel and an oversized blue cap. He looked like he hasn't shaved in a few days, and I could tell from the redness of his eyes that he must have not slept in a while. Where are you headed, miss? He said in a tired voice. I just need to head to the nearest town or pit stop where I can get cell reception. I pointed a thumb at my rundown car. My ride broke down, so I need to call a tow truck for it. The man looked at my broken car and smiled at me. I'd be glad to help. Hop in. I trusted this guy about as far as I could throw him. Just from his appearance alone, he was ringing alarm bells in my head. But my mother always told me not to judge people by the way they look, and beggars couldn't exactly be choosers. Besides, I was pretty sure I could defend myself if the need ever arose. I might not look like it, but I've served in the Navy since I was 18. Sure, I wasn't involved in direct combat, but I still had enough basic combat training to take on one fat trucker if I had to. I got into the man's truck, kicking away several cans of energy drinks as I lifted myself onto the shotgun seat. The guy tried to make conversation with me and I tried my best to humor him. He was kind of awkward though. I couldn't tell if it was because he was tired or if he just wasn't good at making small talk. Eventually, the topic of conversation started to get creepy. It started off with him asking if I had a boyfriend. I told him that no, I didn't. I also added that I wasn't interested in finding one anytime soon either. 
when he asked me what my measurements were, I just stopped talking to him altogether and started looking out the window. I pretended to be taking in the surrounding sights of sand, sand, and more sand, with the occasional cactus to liven up the scenery. He didn't like that very much. Despite me pretending to be distracted by my phone, he continued to ramble on about his thoughts of how women should behave and how hard it was for a nice guy like him to get a date with women nowadays. My brain cells had better things to do than listen to his bullshit, so I started tuning him out of my mind. Every now and then, I would nod or mutter an uninterested "Uh uh-huh, but for the most part, I allowed myself to daydream throughout the ride. Somewhere down the line, I started noticing a sound that came sporadically from behind me, where the truck's trailer was. It was the sound of something tapping against metal. I didn't think much of it at first, assuming that it was just the cargo banging against the metal walls. But when the sound kept coming and going, even an hour into the ride, I finally realized that there was a pattern to the tapping that I took way too long to recognize. Tap, tap, tap. Tap, tap, tap. Tap, tap, tap. The sound would have been annoying had I not been able to understand what they meant. However, I kept my disinterested poker face on for the rest of the ride. The self-discipline I learned from the Navy helped me keep calm under the pressure until we reached a pit stop. The trucker offered to take me the rest of the way instead of leaving me there. With my heart pounding, I agreed, but told him that I wanted to go grab a snack from the pit stop's convenience store first. I calmly went into the convenience store, walked up to the cashier, and told him to call the police because I had a kidnapping to report. He seemed hesitant at first, but quickly did as I said when I showed him my veteran card. I told him to keep the trucker outside there until the police arrived. The cashier called over the guy working the gas pumps, who was also a veteran himself. After hearing me out, he agreed to pretend like there was a problem with the gas pumps to stall the trucker until the police could get there. When the police finally arrived, they checked the trucker's trailer and confirmed my suspicions. The foul stench of human excrement and urine wafted out from the trailer the moment it was opened. Inside were over a dozen women chained to the walls with duct tape over their mouths. Many of them looked malnourished and on the verge of death. Every single one of them had suffered injuries that came from being sexually assaulted. The tapping I'd heard wasn't just a random noise. It was a cry for help sent to me by one of the kidnapped women in Morse code. Thankfully, I remembered enough Morse code from my time in the Navy to recognize the universal signal for help. Tap, tap, tap. S. Tap, tap, tap. O. Tap, tap, tap. S. S O S. Save our souls. I never found out why the trucker kidnapped those women whether he was working for a human trafficking ring or was just a sick and twisted son of a bitch. I have no idea. I just know that had I not picked up on the message sent by the kidnapped woman, I might have very well joined her in the trailer that night. This may sound weird, but I get an uncanny feeling whenever someone mentions Disneyland. I used to work there as a ride operator. I started with the Space Mountain ride and later got shifted to Matterhorn bobsled. My job included ensuring safety measures, such as checking the seat belts and making sure each bobsled is running smoothly before the passengers arrive. I had a co-worker, and together we looked after the Matterhorn. For the sake of the story, let's call him Mark. Mark and I were a good team. No faults could ever escape our eyes. One time, a passenger was getting on a bobsled when Mark stopped him, saying he'd better go for the next one, as this one is missing a screw. We pulled the bobsled aside, and I did find a missing screw on the area where the wheels are attached to. When I asked Mark how did he know it, he replied someone whispered to his ears. I was a bit confused with his weird reply, but then he said it was just a lucky guess. I didn't think about it much, because he was working on the ride way before me so these intuitions come in handy when you gather enough experience. Our duties also included checking the entire track after closing hours, looking for lost items. 
Sometimes people dropped off their things out of excitement of the ride, and we had to walk the entire track at night to make sure everything was in place for the next day. The differences between Disneyland in the day and Disneyland after dark were far from reality. A place that's never silent when the sun is in the sky suddenly turns into a graveyard of toys and rides after the closing hours. I still remember the first time when I walked the track with Mark. I could feel extremely cold air blowing inside the Matterhorn tracks. It was quite surprising because there's obviously no air conditioning inside these caves, and it was warm enough outside. Not just that, but there stood this one particular big cavern in the middle of the ride, with a burnt out light. No matter how many times we changed the bulb there, it always stopped working after a day or two. Mark never bothered about any of this, hence I overlooked these matters too. Until one day, something really weird happened. I was walking down the tracks with a flashlight, checking for any item. Mark was way ahead of me. We were in the cave with no light. Even though I could see Mark, I could see his flashlight moving in the dark. I was thinking of increasing my speed to catch up with him, when I saw something sparkling at the side of the track. As I flashed my torch light on it, I discovered a bunch of keys. I crouched down to pick it up when someone whispered to my ears, Move away, it's coming. And just then, I heard the noise of wheels squeaking on the track and saw an empty bobsled coming at me at full speed. I tripped over and fell on the track out of the sudden shock, screaming, Mark, Mark! I hit my chin falling on the iron tracks and blood came out. I still grabbed the wound with my hand and turned over to dodge that speeding bobsled. But it was gone. Mark came running. What happened? What the hell? He picked me up and we came out. I sat on a chair while Mark washed off the wound and put a bandage on it. I'll check the track early in the morning. You must have tripped over due to the stones on the track. These electricians can never do a clean job. I told him repeatedly to clean the track after fixing the wiring inside the wall, but bloody hell. Mark went on rebuking the electrician guy for not cleaning the track after work, and I sat down quietly wondering what just happened inside. When Mark noticed I wasn't reacting at all, he asked, Dude, are you alright? I don't know. I'm sure I heard someone. And that bobsled, it, it vanished. What? What are you saying? I took a pause and told Mark that I heard a woman's voice inside those tracks. I told him how she told me to move aside, and just then I saw an empty bobsled coming at me from nowhere, and I fell on the ground out of a sudden panic. But when I turned over, the bobsled was gone, as if I had imagined it. But I heard the wheels on the track. How can I imagine such a thing? Mark's face turned serious all of a sudden and I could tell he knows something that I don't. What? What is it? Um, I think you're tired. You better go home and take some rest. The work pressure is getting to you, you know. Please, I know what I saw. Mark, please tell me if you know something. Don't make me sit here thinking that I'm some kind of a crazy guy who hit his head. Mark exhaled a deep breath and said, <sighs> Look, man. I don't know how much of it is true, but these things started after the accident on the Matterhorn ride. People see and hear things that aren't there, but you'll get used to it, because shit happens, you know, and we should learn to ignore them. It's better that way. What accident? What exactly happened there, Mark? Summing up what Mark told me, three years back, a woman named Dolly took this ride. Dolly was a mother who went on the ride with her children. She was worried about them, so she undid her seatbelt and turned to look at them. The train went into a sharp decline while entering the big cavern, and she was thrown from the train onto the tracks. Before she could get up and move, another bobsled came at full speed, running her over. I couldn't speak for half an hour after hearing this. Suddenly, a question came to mind. Mark, the day you guessed the screw missing in the ride, Will you still say it was a lucky guess? Mark patted my back and said, You'll get used to her with time. She never hurts anyone, though. 
In fact, she helps me in every way possible. No, I didn't keep working there to get used to a woman's spirit that haunts a ride at night. Now I know why the light near the cavern always fuses out. Mark said the cavern is often referred to as Dolly's Dip by many co-workers. I don't know how normal it is to work around a ghost, but no matter what, I am never going back to Dolly's Dip, even in daylight. I grew up in a doomsday cult. However, I didn't realize that's what it was until much later. Since I was born and raised there, I just assumed that all the messed up stuff I saw growing up was the way things were supposed to be. Whether it be the beatings we'd be subjected to for not doing our chores well enough, or the way our teachers would demonize the world outside our little community, I thought it was all normal because that's what my parents and elders told me. Kids tend to take things at face value like that. We called ourselves the last family because that's what we thought we would become. Every Sunday, the entire town would gather at the church to listen to our leader, Father Christopher, preach about how we chosen few will be the ones to inherit the earth after God has destroyed every civilization on the planet. Well, I called the place a town, but in reality, it was a little more than a survival compound in the middle of the Arizona desert. There, the cult could hide from the outside world and prepare for the end of the world they thought was coming. I never questioned them. They were my elders, after all. I thought that they probably knew more about how the world worked than I did. I kept that mind frame all the way up to the day that I left. It wasn't me who decided to leave, though. I was about 11 years old when this all happened. It started with a sermon at the church held by our leader, Father Christopher himself. The usual last family sermon was already a fire and brimstone speech meant to instill fear in its devout listeners but this one was even more full of vitriol than usual. At first, Father Christopher shouted the scripture at us in the dramatic way we'd come to expect from him. But near the end of his impassioned speech, his voice grew calm and took on a grim tone that scared his flock more than the overt rage and zeal of his usual sermon. My faithful children, he said in a low voice that caused a somber atmosphere to pervade every pew of the church. It is with a heavy heart that I tell you all that the end is upon us, not of the world, though I know that will come soon as well. No, what I speak of is the end of us and our way of life, of the last family and its faithful members, not at the hands of God, but of men. An uneasy silence fell upon the church. Nobody wanted to say anything, or rather, nobody could. We all knew Father Christopher was quick to punish anyone who interrupted him during a sermon, so we kept our mouths shut and our questions to ourselves. It felt like an eternity before Father Christopher finally broke the silence. The unwitting servants of the devil may come to take us away from our home any day now. Their earthly leaders have deemed us to be a threat to their tyrannical authority over men's souls. They could not possibly understand that we are merely trying to protect the soul of humanity from the end of days. They shall be forced to die a thousand deaths in the pit of fire while we die only once and be welcomed by the Lord's embrace. Father Christopher dismissed us early that day, but only the children the adults had to stay behind for the rest of the sermon. Despite the foreboding tone of the sermon, I remember feeling glad to have more free time that time. Over-exaggeration wasn't new to Father Christopher anyways. He must have predicted the exact date of Doomsday that obviously didn't happen like three times before already. Given his track record, I thought the sermon was just another case of him making mountains out of molehills again and brushed it off. I said goodbye to my older brother Jacob, who was old enough to be considered an adult by the last family standards, and went out to play with the other kids, who were also eager to make use of their newfound free time. Later that night, I was awoken from my sleep by someone shaking me. I opened my blurry eyes and saw my brother standing over me with a look of silent panic on his face. Jacob? I asked, still tired from all the playing I did that day. 
What's wrong? Is Father Christopher calling us to him again? I didn't hear any announcement. Don't worry about him, sis, Jacob said in a soft voice. I'm gonna need you to do everything I say, okay? I'm sure you have a lot of questions, but you have to trust me right now. Can you do that? Uh, sure, I said, growing concerned. Is... is everything alright? Everything will be alright, Jacob assured me. Now, keep your voice down and follow me. Also, try not to make any noise. Jacob held me by the hand and led me out of the communal sleeping area I shared with over a dozen other kids in the compound. I couldn't see very well in the pitch darkness, but Jacob didn't seem to have any trouble guiding me. I guess he must have allowed his eyes to adjust to the dark already. He opened the door and eased it closed behind us, as if he were handling dynamite, careful to not make any excess noise with the way he moved. No sooner had he closed the door, we saw the beams of multiple flashlights approaching us from the direction of the church. Shit, Jacob cursed under his breath before lowering his back to me. Hurry, hop on my back. I was confused, but did as I was told, and kept quiet. I could feel his heart beating out of his chest as he carried me on his back through the compound, like a thief in the night. I'm sure my own heart must have been racing as well. Jacob only let me down once we reached the border of our compound, marked by a tall barbed wire fence. He pushed aside a tall bush on the fence, revealing a large gap in the wire wide enough to fit a person through. He squeezed himself through to the other side before turning to look at me. Follow me, Jacob said in a hushed whisper. Hurry. At that, I hesitated. Up until that very moment, the compound had been my whole world, and everyone there had warned me about the outside world. Just taking a step beyond that fence felt like stepping into the lion's den. I thought God might strike me down where I stood the moment I set foot on the other side. Please, sis, Jacob pleaded. I don't want to leave you here. It was the desperate look in my brother's eyes that finally got me to follow him. He led me to a truck parked just outside the compound. The high-ranking members who could come and go as they pleased often used it to do supply runs outside the compound. I don't know how Jacob got his hands on its keys, but at that point I didn't bother to ask. He drove us far away from the compound at full speed. I watched through the back window of the car as everything I've ever known grew smaller and smaller before disappearing in the distance. We eventually made it to what I would later learn was called a hotel. My brother rented us a room and told me to wait in it, with the door locked until he got back from the police station. I didn't waste any time playing around all the new things I'd never seen before in the hotel room. Among those things were the television. I pressed the biggest button on the TV and jumped back when the screen lit up with moving pictures. I would have been delighted at the new discovery if it wasn't for what these moving pictures showed me. The channel was tuned to the news, in which the reporter was covering a massacre, complete with live footage at a place I recognized. It was the compound I'd just left, my old home. They showed the communal sleeping area where I myself was asleep only a few hours before. The kids on the beds, people I knew and grew up with, lay lifeless in sheets, stained by their own blood. Their expressions were frozen in a silent, eternal scream. Blood poured from large slits on their throats. At the foot of their beds were the bodies of the adults, their parents, and guardians of the kids. The adults all had knives sticking out of their chests, with their cold, dead hands still gripping the handle. The reporter explained that the adult members of the last family had smothered and slit the throats of their children before taking their own lives with the very same knives. They had all decided that it was better to die with their children than be separated from them once the authorities came to inspect the compound all except one. To this day, I can't thank my brother enough for bringing me away from that cult. I intend to make the best out of this new life he's given me. I used to date a really clingy girl. 
She said that she was just being protective of me while we were dating, but I didn't really see it that way. She'd text me every night asking me about my day or how I was doing and if I didn't reply right away, she started guilt tripping me to call her back. It was kind of cute at first, but after a while, it started to feel overbearing. We eventually broke up after almost a year of dating. She seemed to take it pretty well, though we were quiet whenever we ran into each other during class or out in the town. One day, I found out that she got a part-time job at the cafe I liked to study at during the weekend. She made my coffee exactly the way she knew I liked it, and we started talking again. The awkward post-breakup tension between us melted away every time I visited the cafe. She even made sure to save a blueberry muffin for me on days she knew I'd visit. Soon, we were talking with each other like normal friends again. I couldn't be happier. For a time, I even felt like we had a chance of getting back together after all. That feeling wouldn't last though. My sister came to visit one weekend. We hadn't seen each other since we went to different colleges, so we were looking forward to catching up. We decided to get some pizza together at an Italian restaurant right across the cafe my girlfriend worked at. The waitress led us to an open-air two-person table on the second floor beside the fenced ledge. It looked like the sort of seat you take your date to for a romantic view. There was even a rose in a vase decorating the table. I swear, I saw the waitress smirk when she showed us the table too. She must have thought that my sister and I were a couple. Which, fair enough, we didn't really look like each other despite having the same parents. I took after our dad, while she looked more like our mom. Neither of us bothered to correct her though. If they were going to give us special treatment just because they thought we were a couple, then we weren't about to complain. Not long after we sat down, I got a text on my phone. I looked at it and saw that it was my ex asking me how I was doing. We'd been texting again as of late anyway, so I didn't think much of it. Hey, no texting at the table. My sister said in jest, just as I was about to type back a reply. If you don't pay attention to your food, the flies will eat them. She used the exact same words our mom did whenever either of us checked our phones during dinner. Even got the inflections in her voice down too. Of course, I was a little annoyed that my younger sister was trying to boss me around, but she had a point. I quickly replied to my ex saying that I'll text her back later and turned off my phone. My sister and I talked for over two hours about how we were doing in college. When I told her that I was single again, she said she had a few female friends in her own college that were still single. She went as far as to offer me their numbers. I wasn't all that interested, but decided to humor my sister anyway, to make her feel helpful more than anything else. I turned my phone back on to save the numbers. The moment I did, I was bombarded with notifications for over a hundred text messages and dozens of voicemails. Every single one of them were from my ex. The last text, sent almost an half hour ago, simply read, look down. I looked down from the ledge of the seat and felt my stomach churn in panic. Standing on the streets below us was my ex-girlfriend, still wearing her barista uniform. Her wide bloodshot eyes stared right at me and through me. The look on her face was a horrifying mix between anger and batshit crazy. She held her phone in one hand and in the other, a long kitchen knife gripped so tight that her knuckles were white. A chill shot through my body as I showed the text to my sister. Her face went pale as she looked down over the ledge as well. The moment my sister's eyes met my ex's, my ex's gaze turned from obsessive infatuation to burning hatred. She clenched her teeth so hard that I could have sworn blood seeped from her teeth. Without warning, she threw the kitchen knife in her hand at my sister with surprising force. The tip of the blade clinked against the ledge fence and clattered back onto the ground, but it startled my sister enough that she fell out of her chair. That got the attention of a nearby waiter who came over to help her up. We quickly explained the situation to him and the police were immediately called. My ex-girlfriend was dragged, kicking and screaming into a police car. All the while, she shouted about how she and I belonged together and that the girl I was eating with didn't deserve me, not knowing that that girl was actually my sister. When the police searched her apartment for more evidence of her stalking, they found hundreds of photos of me plastered on the walls. Some of them were from our time together, but many of them were of me by myself. There were pictures of me studying at the cafe or walking home alone, all taken without me ever noticing. In the corner of the apartment was a small shrine with a framed picture of us when we were together, surrounded by the empty cups of every coffee I'd ever ordered from her at the cafe. 
My sister is still traumatized about the whole thing, but she's been getting the help she needed. And despite everything that's happened, I hope that my ex will get the help she needs now too.